Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting in order. When I'm three minutes late, I only give one lock. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Carter, I think will be with us on Zoom. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Uh, I'm here. <clears throat> and we're sorry that you're not feeling well, but glad you're able to join us on Zoom. Okay, Mr. Carter has the uh, invocation and so forth. Mr. Turner, would you like to Certainly, on? certainly. Back heads, please. Dear Lord, uh, thank you for this day, opportunity to gather, to consult, and to handle the county's business. We pray, pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment. Amen. Do you please uh, join me in the prayer? We just to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have a motion as to the agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 There was one adjustment uh, if you'd like to consider adding an additional closed session. If not, I we think can we need do that need at the end. That based on what I understood earlier, would you modify your motion to include a closed session? We already have a closed session. But a second item on our play session. I believe it was Commissioner Lush. Yeah, I that's fine. That's Thank fine. you. I forgot about that. You, I apologize. Will you no amend your second? Y'all went so quickly. I, I will, but I think we need to define what it is. Sure. Yes. So um, we're going to have a closed session related to an economic development incentive, and I'll make sure that the clerk has the proper statutory language for the minutes. Thank you. Okay, so amended, second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, public speakers. <coughs> Is that Tommy Bruton? Bruton. Bruton, thank you. I almost could read your handwriting. That's if you'll good. come forward, Bye. please. To the Chairman, is there a name okay, it was typed in. I didn't see it. I didn't know whether to keep approaching or not. <laughs> You'll be next. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Thank you very much for having me today. My name's Tommy Bruton. I'm a resident of Gray. Have been a resident of Gray my entire life. I really appreciate what each and every one of you do. And I'm, I really mean that. You have daggers and darts thrown at you constantly, and you can't please everybody. And I knew your daddy, and he was a great guy. <laughs> but he can handle it very well. Thank you, sir. But uh, the talk of, and nobody, I want this to be very clear, nobody supports law enforcement as much as I do. Nobody. It's the number one un, uh, thing that unites us all is the law. Uh, it's the same reason that uh, the richest and the poorest drive the same speed limit and they pay the taxes. It's the law. That's what unites us. So I'm a big supporter of that. But building this new courthouse or the, for the judges, I'm highly against that. And I'll, I'll, there's a couple reasons, and I'll lead into that. But uh, a lot of times I've had a lot of lawyers i've talked to some lawyers i've had a lot of police officers tell me judges are not there on friday a lot of times they don't have court during the week many lawyers have told me they have to go to the judge's house to get something signed why do we need that if we get a new courthouse for lawyers that means a parking deck somewhere down the line or a 
spending more money for the taxpayers. It's not necessary. It's not necessary at all. The point I'm trying to get to is the the root of the problem. Let's look back to when this world was looking like it should. Back in the 60s and 70s, what were we doing? We didn't have the shootings we have now. We didn't have the crime we have now. The, no, nobody can dispute that. What were we doing? We had discipline. Discipline in our school system. And I don't mean time out. Sometimes you have to, you know, if you have to spank that bottom, you have to spank that bottom. And if it don't work, maybe you have to spank it a little harder. But sooner or later, they'll get the idea. Uh, discipline works. Disciplined children are happier children. It, look at people that go into the service that you thought would never turn out to be anything. They turned out to be pretty good as soon as they come out of basic training. It was yes, sir, and no, sir. We've got to change the way these kids are brought up, and the only way we can do that is in the school system, public school system. I think charter schools and private schools are what public schools were when I was in school. That's the way I feel about it. And you say, well, what's that got to do with us? It's you the leaders, I'm putting it on y'all. Not just the commissioners, councilmen, uh, sheriffs, police officers, uh, city uh, chiefs, everybody, governors, all of it needs to be, this needs to be heard. It was changed one time to where it is now, to where nobody has discipline. That is the worst thing in the world, and that must be my three minutes. I understand that. But change this back and get involved and do whatever you got to do to put discipline back in the schools, and then one day you will see this thing turn around again. But thank each one of you for having me, and I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, commissioners. How you doing? My name is Stuart Smith. I'm a resident of Mebbin. I would like to express my thoughts concerning the courthouse project and funding. As I watched the recent commissioner's meeting February 20th, I listened intently to the information being presented. Less than a month ago, many citizens in Alamance County were not aware of a need to upfit or replace the courthouse. I was really concerned by the proposed method to pay for the project. 44% of the school bond funding passed by voters in Alamance County in 2018 was used to build one high school. The remaining funds were used to address other immediate needs. The majority of our schools did not get any bond funding at all. There are needs to be addressed today. There are roofs to be repaired or replaced, windows that need to be replaced, etc. One major concern is aging HVAC equipment that will need to be replaced some much sooner than later. To meet today's codes and meet environmental concerns, the cost of this equipment has increased exponentially. Reducing the funds designated for ABSS was presented as the best option based on the information we had. We heard the term right-sizing the funding for ABSS. Using numbers at one cent on the tax rate has changed from 1.3 to 1.6 million today is misleading. This does not account for the fact that 1.3 million pre-COVID is much less today due to inflation. I hope we do not deduct as much proposed at any at all from the ABSS capital reserves to fund this project. We still have many needs in ABSS. If the ABSS capital reserves increases enough, perhaps we can repair or replace some roofs without another bond issue. Voters in Alamance County have rejected the quarter cent sales and use tax four times. It is interesting that many voters stated that they did not understand it after failing to vote for it to support the last school bond issue. Should we look at this again? Today, one cent on property tax will generate $1.6 million, according to our county manager. If the Article 46 one quarter cent sales tax would have been in effect in 2022, it would have generated $7.1 million. The information is from the Alamance County Tax Office. If the members of the Alamance County Bar Association and other people of influence in Alamance County advocate for this, perhaps the voters will pass it 
if they truly understand how it can reduce property tax and still fund our needs. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think it's uh, Tanya Klein. Did I pronounce your name correctly? It's Tanya. Thank Tanya, thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Um, good morning, board members. My name is Tanya Klein. I live at um, Brookview Drive in Gibsonville. I'm a former ABSS school employee and the parent of two ABSS students, both in high school. Today I'm here to express disagreement with the option to fund renovations to our county courthouse with ABSS capital reserve funds. And I'm asking you to consider using the county's capital reserve funds instead. Even with the facility repairs included in the $150 million bond projects, the Alamance County Capital Plan approved in June of 2022 lists 10 schools in need of not yet funded repairs that total over $17 million. These include simple things like updates to roofing, HVAC systems, and doors and windows, not exactly luxuries. Excluding the new high school, the average age of our 36 school buildings is almost 55 years old. Making the protection of the ABSS capital reserve funds crucial for current and future facility needs is very important. Please vote against any proposal that takes money from ABSS. Thank you for your time. And thank you. Anthony Pierce. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. It's, it's been a while, uh, but it's time to get back to uh, partnering with you all to uh, make sure that we solve some of the problems that we have with the county. Today, this morning, just like a couple others, I'm speaking regarding the funding sources the county is looking to use in order to fund the much needed courthouse renovations and additions. I reviewed the options presented at the last meeting and one in particular concerned me and many others in the community a great deal. The option C proposal, which was to pull the funds from the ABS model, ABSS model and move it to the county model thus causing their fund balance to dip concerningly low given all the needs that ABSS has that we're not that were not able to be addressed or funded during the last budget cycle. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Last year we had a surplus of tax dollars due to the increase in revenue uh, versus what was projected as a deficit that uh, was thought during the, co during the COVID crisis. The courthouse renovation project was discussed at great length during that time and several funding options were discussed at that time. A few to name was ARP funds, the opioid monies, sales tax increases, other fundings um, and other sources were also discussed during the time. But never once was it suggested, implied, thought about, considered, or even imagined that we would pull from ABSS to fund the much needed project. The excess dollars could have been used for this project. Instead, the board decided to decrease the property taxes by a very small percentage. I, as well as others, maybe even some of you, might at that time thought that it probably wasn't the best approach given the many needs that we have across the county. We now face a huge dilemma. You have to even consider raising taxes above what you lowered it last year to cover this cost. We all know the important need to renovate the courthouse to allow for our judges, our attorneys, the support staff to have a facility that works for all. But I'm sure we all can agree that this should not be done or take priority over our kids, our teachers, the staff, et cetera. And I highly suggest that we send the right message if we're gonna support ABSS schools and our kids and have a forward thinking approach, then every vote should account for that. I'm not gonna tell you how to pull the funds because there's several ways and I think that we can dive deeper into that, but I think we should take pulling from ABS off the table um, so we can send the right message across the county that this board truly supports the school system and knows all the challenges that they have and know there's not an infinite number of dollars to fix everything, but the county commissioners support ABS school board and they're going to partner and get their relationship even better over time. Thank you. Thanks, sir. 
a stranger to the sport, Henry Lyons. <laughs> Henry, have you had a speech at each one of our meetings, or have you missed one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Henry Vines from uh, 3450 Eyes Driving Snow Camp. Uh, today I just uh, wanted to address you about the Meridian uh, contract. I have read it over, and um, it contradicts itself in several different places, and I'm not sure as to why. Uh, I just want each one of you to realize that how much impact this is going to have on our little small community. Um, when this operation started some 30 years ago, I went and spoke out for Kent and uh, was glad to do so. This is a family operation that's went on for 30 years. Uh, now we're wanting to change this over to a, a corporation that's wanting to operate it at its capacity. And we're wanting to even give an additional uh, amount of 150 more tons to that. And as I read through this thing, I, I read and it, it says that they can haul in 750 tons, 365 days a year. And it does not include recycled material. So I don't know how many tons would come in under the recycling uh, section of that. Um, commissioners, I, I don't want to dapper anybody's uh, it, way of selling their stuff but I think this franchise that's being uh, considered if it's going to be a transfer it should be at least what what's been proposed what's been given in the past and um, the county's not receiving its same amount of money a dollar per ton and um, I just hope that y'all will consider this and uh, also uh, in the last paragraph down there it says that this company will abide by the HIDO rules. Well, the HIDO rules clearly states that you can't run but five days a week, eight to five, and uh, on, on high impact industries. So as you look at this and consider this, I hope that you would uh, back up these uh, amounts that they can bring in. Uh, I'm sure this company wants to have the 750 tons that will generate them about $10.5 million a year. It's a pretty good chunk of money. So just be aware as to what kind of stress and strain you're going to put on this community from a family operation into, an, into a corporation operation that could increase from 15, 20 trucks a day up to 100 trucks a day in that little bit of community. And I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> Thank you. Next item on our agenda is a public hearing uh, as to the, uh, for the Burlington School Council for the Burlington School is the way it reads. <laughs> Please, sir. Hello, I'm Jeff Poley with the law firm of Hawkins, Delafield and Wood. I'm over in Raleigh, thanks for having us today. Burlington School would like to borrow $6 million on a tax exempt basis in part to refinance a taxable loan um, taken out for their last building project and then um, because of increasing enrollment um, continue to build out their, their campus. Um, in order to do this, they're going through the Wisconsin Public Finance Authority, which a majority of um, private schools do as, as of today in North Carolina. It's also what several hospitals have used, including Cone Health, Elements, Regional, and I can name several others. 
what is here before you is a description of the project. We have to, for federalism reasons, because it's federal tax exemption, they want um, you all to approve the project and at least in theory the, um, in theory, the um, issuance of bonds. You will note in your resolution this does not, um, this does not constitute debt of the county. It does not uh, implicate your um, bond ratings and you have, it sets forth that you have done no due diligence on the project itself. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I might indicate to the audience, we have an extensive packet on this. Uh, it is in our agenda and you could have reviewed it. Uh, Mr. Vines, I'm sure you did review it. <laughs> as you do every month or every meeting thank you um is there any other comment as to this matter from commission i'm just curious what are you going to use it for um let me refer to my notes because it, it's a long list uh there's a 148 million dollar 1.48 million dollar taxable loan out for the um previous um upper school building and then the, the new um financing will be a 1,250 square foot um, annex. I don't know exactly what, if you'd call that, but it's gonna be connected to the upper school. Renovations to existing buildings to accommodate the, the annex. And then kind of stuff that will kind of go into it with an atrium and then uh, staff rooms and so on. So they, um, they are prepared, they have had significant uh, enrollment increases mm -hmm. and they're trying to keep up and um, facilities obviously are an important important thing for them absolutely That's it for me. any other question just a comment um, my children are 32 28 and 25 and they went to elementary school at the burlington day school and i met my very best friends there and they're still my best friends and they served us well and i'm glad to see that they're adding i think everybody has a choice to where they want to go to school that best fits their kids needs so congratulations then i will make a motion uh, that we pass a resolution of the board of the commissioners of alamance county north carolina approving the issuance of the public finance authority uh, of the educational facilities revenue bonds in one or more series in the um, aggregate principal amount of not to exceed six million dollars uh, quick question uh this is titled as a public hearing is that an official public hearing yes. before we before we vote on that i, I, I would just suggest that we actually exactly. have the, an actual hearing okay. with the with the presentation um uh, do we have a motion at this point to go into the public hearing? So moved. So. A motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we're now in the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone on this side of the room that would like to address this commission for this matter? Anyone on this side? Is there anyone in the... No, sir. Any comments whatsoever? Is there a motion to cut and close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay, now, are there any questions from the county commissioners? Well, I'll second your motion. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, what just one point I'd like to make and I understand that the reason that we're having the public hearing and taking a vote is that the lending institution requires that there be one whenever public bonds are issued is that accurate that's correct okay the county has no involvement correct. the county is not on the hook for insurance or anything like that that's correct okay. any other comments all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Have a safe trip back to Rome. Thank you.
back what we had. Anybody else has the agenda? We're now going to item 7 8. Do I want to introduce the question? I'm sorry, Chairman, what was that? <laughs> no. This We're is ready. the Meridian uh, Franchise Ordinance. That's right. And who's presenting on that? Uh, Rick and I are going to present together. He'll kick it off. We have some guests uh, from Meridian with us as well, and then I'll walk us through the highlights of. Um, what's proposed in the franchise. Thank you. So this is the second of two considerations for a franchise related to granting, uh, for an ordinance related to granting a franchise to Meridian to operate the present Coble site. And so we have worked out an agreement with Meridian to propose to the board to consider as part of that ordinance adoption. And if you recall from the last time we spoke about this, you have to vote actually twice to approve the ordinance to grant the franchise for Meridian to operate. So that's what we're here to do today. We have some representatives from Meridian in the audience with us to speak to any points and questions you might have related to the finer points of the agreement. Sure, I'd be happy to introduce them. Um, we have Dave Lavender, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Meridian, as well as Mary O'Brien, the Chief Marketing Officer. These are the same two individuals that appeared before the board the last time uh, we were here. We're ready to walk through um, the proposed franchise agreement. Um, I'll just hit some of the highlights and try to um, explain any of questions or uh, clarifications that might be needed. So you'll recall that the board adopted the solid waste um, management ordinance back in November. And once that was taken care of, that uh, allowed us to go through this process. This is the second of two public meetings that you've had on the franchise agreement. And at the last one, you authorized Rick and I to um, begin um, negotiations with Meridian on behalf of the board. So that's where we are today. I'm going to walk through some of the negotiated deal points. Feel free to ask questions as we go. The term of the agreement is for the life of the site of the landfill. And we've tried to explain that this is uh, a requirement of general statutes. This changed in 2017, where counties no longer have the ability to limit the duration. The state requires that um, the franchise would go now for the entire life of site. And that was the general statute um, 13A-294 that governs solid waste. The insurance um, com coverage uh, that we have asked for them to uh, supply is in compliance with the solid waste ordinance that you adopted back in November. The volume that's being proposed is the 750 tons per day. Right now, uh, under the COBOL operation, they're authorized mm -hmm. 600 tons per day, so this is about a 25% increase in the average daily tonnage. The, um, I wanted to mention on the life of site, uh, currently with the COBOL operation, it's about 20 plus years. With this new tonnage at 750, the average, or the, the life of site is estimated to be about 18.7 years. And it is based on uh, operations of 365 days per year. That does not mean that's what they're actually operating. That is just simply how the formula is calculated. Uh, on the daily tonnage. So they do uh, divide that by 365, even though they won't be open 365 days. So they won't be on Saturdays and Sundays? Uh, I think they're prepared to discuss that um, <coughs> I'm sorry, with you. I'm not sure what their hours are presently or what they're proposing, but they are happy to address that. Would you like to do that not now me. or after? No, that's fine. We'll okay. ask them later. And then uh, the next point is the service area. So right now, the uh, we're proposing that there's a 75-mile radius. This is from the parcel lines of the landfill. It would be limited to North Carolina waste, even though the 75 miles does extend well into the Virginia and a little bit in South Carolina. So we'd limit it to North Carolina. Uh, if the radius extends into another county, then the entire county is included on the map. And I'll show you a map here shortly. 
and the company also agrees to give first priority in terms of space in the landfill to Alamance County entity generated waste. Here's the map. Um, the blue circle represents the 75 miles. There's a gold star in the middle that's signifying the a location of this landfill. Sorry. Um, and then I think if you can see, there are three sort of reddish stars where the pointer is. Uh, one, two, and three. They are to the right of that center left star. That is um, designating the transfer stations owned by Meridian. Commissioner Lashley, you had asked about uh, both how many transfer stations they operate and where they were located. So there are three uh, Meridian transfer stations designated on that map. Do they have any transfer stations outside that circle? Do you know? We do not. Okay, thank not, you. Not in this marketplace. Close thank to you. Richmond, Virginia, but we have other facilities. Thank you. Facilities. All right. Moving along, uh, the waste stream is limited to waste or debris that is um, resulting from uh, remodeling and construction demolition. So this meets the definition of the construction and debris materials. Inert debris is also included and accepted. Has to be uncontaminated soil, of course. The tipping fees, um, they're offering a reduced tipping fee to all Alamance County residents that are delivering residential CND materials. They're granted a reduced fee of 90%, so a 10% less <laughs> than the posted gate rate. And they do have to present proof of residency uh, in order to get that discount. Commercially generated CND waste does not qualify. So this is just simply for Alamance County residential. And lastly, uh, for disaster debris, should the governor declare a disaster for Alamance County, the tipping fee would be reduced to 75% of the posted gate rate. And this would be for all Alamance County disaster debris transported either by a contractor of ours, a third, third party, or a county vehicle. Uh, during these times. Heidi, what would classify as a disaster? It could be a, a tornado, a hurricane, ice storm. Train it, derailment. Yes. <laughs> yes. We've already had that conversation, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we don't have that. All right. So on the host fee, uh, we do have the dollar per ton of waste uh, disposed. That's consistent with what you have seen with the COBOL. This is based on monthly volume gets paid to the county monthly, and then the, fish, the official volume of waste is determined by what is submitted to uh, the state. And if we find a discrepancy where the tonnage exceeds the payments, Meridian has to remit the difference of that in 30 days. We also have in here a guaranteed minimum host fee. So if they are taking in uh, less than what they're expecting, then they would guarantee um, a steady amount of revenue to the county. So the amount to be paid would be net of what um, they've already paid. Payment is made annually on the 30th of January for the previous year. So for the partial year of 2023, they would prorate that and guarantee a minimum of 50000 Year one is 50,000, year two is 75,000, and year three and beyond would be $100,000 of guaranteed revenue to the county. And just by uh, way of comparison with COBOL, uh, last fiscal year you received $7,500 in revenue from their operation. Where does that money go? Where it would go in your general fund, it would be unrestricted. Okay. Question, I got a question for you. Yeah. If this money goes into our general fund, mm -hmm. do we not have a safety net just in case excrement hits the fan? I mean, because that is unlimited. I know if it was above the insurance policy, let's just say something happened and we had to pay insurance. We're gonna have to dig into our, our unrestricted funds to pay the balance, correct? If the money, $7,500 went into our, to our un fund. Un unsigned, un unrestricted fund, if we had any issues, the money would come out of the unrestricted fund. So $7,500, 
probably wouldn't buy the ink for the stuff that you'd have to do for this. I just think that's, I just, when you, when you said that, it just made me think that, oh, geez, we could be on the hook for a whole lot more money than just the insurance policy if we're taking that out of restricted policy. You want to talk Yeah, I address yeah. that issue. Uh, we have substantially, under this new contract, increased uh, the insurance, the bonding, everything else that they're doing. And the way I read the contract, we're protected through those extras that COBOL did not have, was not required to have. Well, I Ms. think we're in a much better safe a safe position as far as liability, even if they shut down and walk away. I'd like to hear from the county attorney on this. I think that's an accurate representation of where we are with the new contract. We've increased the insurance requirements substantially um, to beyond what the state would require based on the <coughs> site in question. Um, again, we'd also have uh, better indemnity language in this contract than we did in our past agreement. So we're more protected in that way. And then finally, they're saying in the contract that they're going to comply with the state's requirements for wind down and closing the site, mm -hmm. which we didn't have in the contract language before. So I think, although I understand your concern, and I do always look at those elements, I think we're in a much better position related to liability here than we were before. Yeah. And we presently are, I'll just say that, because the existing uh, COBOL contract is still in effect. So we're in a better position with this new agreement than we presently are. I didn't include the details of the insurance requirements, but you can find that on page five of the agreement where we have all the various components that they're required to provide. Gosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very sensitive. I'm telling you. <laughs> all right. Our next one. Um, the Meridian folks are offering to do a litter cleanup. They'll collect roadside uh, litter on a monthly basis, a half mile from each side of the entrance for a total of one mile uh, on that road in either direction. They're offering uh, to upgrade the entrance with landscaping and signage. And then they're offering uh, some community involvement and in increasing their presence and partnership with our community. They are offering to invest uh, through sponsorship, charitable donations, neighborhood events, and or educational experiences for the community where they will host on-site events for the community to come there at least twice annually. And then, uh, like Rick mentioned, we've got uh, financial assurance for both the closure and post-closure that's mandated by general statutes. They are required to comply with the HIDO that was mentioned. Uh, we're not seeing anything in the HIDO that requires uh, operations of five days per week. So just wanted to clarify that they are in compliance and we'll have them address what their operating hours will be here in a second. And then we also had said from the get-go that this would be contingent upon a traffic impact study being completed and making sure that the board was well informed about any uh, improvements that might be required by DOT or um, any changes that we might expect to the traffic on the road. And so there is a copy of that study that we received this morning it's at your seats. It does state uh, clearly that they do not, uh, the engineers do not see any change or negative impact uh, with the additional traffic there. And I'm sure that they'd be happy to address that as well. So there were no recommendations uh, required or improvements needed to the road to facilitate the increased tonnage that's being proposed. And that's all uh, that I have to walk you all through, but happy to answer questions. And then if Dave or Mary would like to come up and um, state any other points that I might have missed. Did I catch, did I write this down right, that you had mentioned there would be like a 25% increase so the, the average <laughs> daily tonnage right now is 600 tons per day, okay. and what we're proposing is 750 tons per day. Okay. That'd be the maximum that they could take in a day's time. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Carter. <laughs> uh, I've got a question about the uh, operating times. I know that uh, Meridian has indicated they don't have an intent to operate on Saturdays and Sundays as the Cobalt Group has not operated the landfill. 
I wonder if they'd be willing to uh, stipulate that in the contract and I think that would uh, add some comfort to the, the neighbors and, and I know that they have some interest in trying to provide uh, events and services to the uh, citizens of Alamance County out at the landfill at different times that might provide a time for them to schedule things like that. Good morning. Uh, regarding the operating hours and days, we will not be operating on Sundays. Saturdays, we will operate at times from 7 a.m. to we'll be closed by 12 p.m., just depending on need. We'll have to. That's as far as that will go. And that's pursuant to our hideout. I'm sorry? Is that a requirement of the hideout? I'm not sure that that's a requirement of hideout. Um, that, that's come I along thought the hours were, but maybe not. I don't I'm believe it's written that. in there, but um, would you all like us to include their operating hours reflected in this agreement, or is that not necessary? I just know we have been to the second on operating times with the quarry, mm -hmm. and we are not going to show any difference if Walt Disney World comes here. I mean, that's not against y'all, but I mean, we have really worked with them. They have been extremely flexible. For the neighbors out there that's gotten all this and um there's I, we, when you go in business you open business to make money and that's the whole point but um I, I, there's no way that we can have one set of rules for the rock quarry and have another set of rules for any industry that comes here mm -hmm. any industry not just these nice folks i'm just talking about it's going to be the standard needs to be equivalent so well that, my thought is, and again, I don't want to speak for you, I'll let you address this, but my thought is that most of your customers are not going to be open for operation mm -hmm. or wanting to bring waste to you on the weekends normally. Is that right? right. If, if yeah. I could, what it is on Saturday, if you think about it, all your residents who are doing do-it-yourself do <coughs> projects, right. um, some of your small haulers that are bringing the trailer behind their pickup truck, that's the highest traffic that we see on a Saturday. That's why we have half-day hours at our facilities. Um, it's really to be uh, to allow us to clean up maybe some of our transfer floors and get the waste off the floor and deliver it. But most of the traffic is going to be Alamance residents who are d doing their own projects, cleaning up, and the weekend is the only time that they have it exactly. uh, to bring the waste there. Just to understand the fairness. I'm all about fairness. Oh, I'm sure. um, So would y'all be willing to stipulate to no Sunday activity? Absolutely. Okay, I think we could amend the contract for that, don't you? Yes, we can add language into the agreement and then if you want to approve it, we can do that on the basis of an included language to include no operation on Sunday. And I like the idea of offering uh, service to our local citizens on Saturday, I, I like that, so. Okay. Mr. Porter, you sound much, much better today than you did on the phone yesterday. I appreciate <laughs> that. We do. Thank you. Okay. And if I may, may I clarify the traffic study that was made available to you all this morning? Um, the way a traffic study is done, they make assumptions. The assumption is the traffic count will uh, be reduced by the number of uh, Cobal Sand Rock trucks that will no longer be operating and then add the number of trucks that will be associated with the growth of uh, geographic area and tonnage to the facility. Um, the assumption is 65 trucks per day is not the increase but the overall volume that will be coming into the site. I just wanted to clarify it. It is not 100. Uh, the assumption is based on 65 trucks coming to the facility on a regular full work day. Our hours of operation would be 7.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, and then 7.30 to noon on Saturday. And that, that, equip, that 65 was based off of the 750 if it was maxed out. Correct. But you're not, you're not in business yet, so you really don't know. You'll know when you get in business, because we can all predict the future. <laughs> Right. We just know that our yeah. permit and our franchise with okay. you is capped at 750, so we do know that that's gotcha. the upper limit. And that's what they based it on when they did the study. Got the gotcha. Okay. And it's a gradual ramp up, too. It's not like <clears throat> the switch gets turned and that volume is there automatically. That's also come up as a point for the board, and I want to make sure we at least speak to and clarify that. There's been some concern in the community about 365 days of operation. Mm -hmm. I know we just clarified what your operating hours are going to be. But can you speak again and clarify again that the amount in the contract is set as a cap 
for an average per day, whether right. that's actually open that day or not, kind of address that again? Absolutely. It's the way the uh, state of North Carolina and their DEQ uh, addresses their annual tonnage. They do it on an annual basis, not a daily basis. So when we go for the permit amendment at the state level, they'll give us an annual tonnage based on 365 uh, days per year uh, versus Monday through half day Saturday. They don't do all that um, type of analysis. So theirs is based on an overall annual. Uh, our commitment to you is we will be closed on Sundays. Uh, if there ever is a need, uh, an act of God, a natural disaster, we would work with the county uh, that if operations for an emergency purpose needed to be open on Sunday, it's your call whether or not you need that service from us, but that would be uh, addressed at that time or in a you know emergency declaration at that point. Right, we, we would ask for your approval before we would go forward. Thank you. Board, any, any other questions or comments? No, I have just a couple. I <clears throat> particularly like having reviewed the contract that it's uh, the insurance <coughs> that we, the county, will have is much, much greater than we currently have. Um, two, it addresses the closed down, things of that sort uh, that we didn't have before. Uh, the income would be much greater to the county, which would go to the general fund. Um, I see a number of positives. Um, I see concerns with traffic, but we now have the traffic study. Um, I don't see any reason not to grant this continuation of the franchise. Do we have a motion? No, I got some questions for you, Mr. Chairman. If you believe this is a good deal, let me ask you some questions. You tell me how good it is to my citizens of Alamance County. You ready? I'm ready. I may need help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is everything about this from Mr. Coble to Meridian has changed. Every single thing has changed. There's five things that's changed. Mr. Coble told us in the last meeting he does 50 tons a day. This group is gonna do 750 tons a day. And uh, let me just uh, correct something that was put out just before. This is not a 25% increase. 50 goes into 750 15 times. That's a 1500% increase not 25. Understand my math? That's a fact. You're changing this from what Mr. Coble did in the past is he offered sand rock to our citizens. You folks are going to stop that. That's two. 25 miles a day is what he currently does. Mr. Coble currently goes 25 miles a day. This company wants to go 75 miles a day and I wish you'd put up the, uh, the map again and I'm going to show you a couple of things about that map. That map is a radius, and it says in the contract that if the, if, if the 75 miles touches that county, the whole entire county is, is included. Look on, that, look on the outside of that blue shape. Every single county that is being touched includes that whole county. Look at the counties at the south. How many counties can you count that are going to have to take every single thing from that county? Quite a few, probably more than a dozen. So that 75 mile radius is nowhere close to 75 miles. Would you agree? In certain areas, yes. Certain areas. I count 12 counties. That's a whole lot. So that 75 mile radius is probably probably close to 100. So I don't think there's any, there's been any uh, relent on that particular because uh, to 25 miles you'd have to you'd have to be completely illogical in your thinking if you believe that 50 tons a day is going to be anywhere close to the the increase the traffic that you're going to have the interchanges the interchanges are very close to the outside of that that circle that you have there my concern is is there any is there anything um, that we can have to <coughs> make sure that everything is being complied with on these outside counties. I mean, because if it's in the county, I mean, it's going to take the whole thing. You're almost to the beach with these things. 
Uh, the traffic. The traffic, I mean, once again, you have to think about it illogical to think that the traffic's not going to increase when you're increasing your, your, um, your business by 1,500%. And on top of that, in this contract, you can take as much recycled material that you want and pull it out. You could, you could be pulling in, you could be pulling in 1,500 tons a day. If, seven, if 800 tons were recycled, you're pulling that out, so you only get 700. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of things in this contract that's completely, I think, illogical. Uh, it says in one part of the contract that it's only going to be in the state of North Carolina. But as we see here, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that's very close to uh, the, the state of South Carolina. And Virginia is included here. But it says the state of North Carolina, so I'm assuming you guys are going to go past the, the lines of North Carolina. Is that correct? That's correct. <coughs> okay, so the state, state of North Carolina. So I guess, and just keep going here. Based on what they just told me, John, 65 trucks a day in a nine hour, in a nine hour day, if I'm doing my math right, comes to about eight and a half minutes a month. Uh, eight and a half trucks per Excuse me, one truck, one truck per every eight and a half minutes. It's going to be coming through there. I bet Mr. Cobo doesn't have <clears throat> six trucks an hour coming to your place right now, do you? Yeah, that's with, uh, the sand rock. with the sand rock. You, you will have the with the sand rock. Sure. So, um, you know, I just I think there's a lot of things in the contract. You know, I think one thing it really made me think that maybe this is not such a great idea is when the recycle gets pulled out. I mean, you guys could do a, and, and the recycle doesn't just stop it like aluminum, like aluminum cans, like most people are, you know, doing with, with uh, the recycles. This has everything, I mean, concrete, concrete's a huge recycling event. I mean, you pull a concrete out of that parking lot over there, uh, you can use all that concrete to uh, put down, I've been told by construction workers, you can put all that concrete, chop it up, break it up and put it as a bed for a foundation for another house. So that knows a lot of things that's coming into your landfill is recycled, recycled material that I think you guys are gonna, not only are you gonna charge the people to, to bring the stuff to your landfill, but you're also gonna, I was gonna ask you, do you plan on having a recycling center at the landfill? We believe that there are recyclable products within some of the C&D material that comes to all, all of our C and D sites that we have throughout. Uh, we think it's smart environmentally to extract what makes economic viable sense. In that case, concrete. We're not going to be shipping it out somewhere else. We need that concrete for the roadbeds within the facility. Mm -hmm. Dirt. Again, another product that may come in. If we aren't getting it from the waste stream that's already coming to our site, we're going to have to be contracting with third parties to haul it in anyway as an operation of the landfill. That wouldn't be considered C&D waste. It wouldn't affect our tonnage, but it'd be another means that we'd have to go out, buy soil. It'd be another truck coming regardless. So if we can recycle it from the materials that are already coming in, we believe that that's the responsible thing to do for sustainability, as well as, quite honestly, in some cases, redu reducing some truck traffic. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. If you're <clears throat> bringing a load in, and you're separating the recycles out from the stuff that can go into the debris that can go into the landfill. Do you, uh, will you have trucks coming into your facility to pick up that recycled material to take it out? The only thing that we would see something along that line is if there's a steel or metal material that obviously we cannot use in the operation of the landfill. It's not good for you know, trucks to run over and things along that line. We do believe it's smart to recycle steel, but that's really just coming in from the material that we will hand pick out. I, I am telling you now, we are not proposing a construction and demolition debris MRF line um, at this facility. It, the volume here, believe it or not, does not uh, constitute the economic invest, investment to put in a CND sort line, which has the individuals and the machines that pick out recyclables. Really, our goal is for the material that comes in, if there is economically viable recyclable materials, in particular that we can use on site to help us prevent from having to bring that off site to better manage the landfill facility and be in compliance with state and local statutes, that's what we propose to recycle. We are not going to be marketing uh, your residential 
single stream. We're not interested in newspapers, plastics, aluminum cans, anything along that line. It's really just those materials that we believe have economically viable benefit to recycle that A, we can use on site, or B, those metals that have uh, a value that we would ship off. Do you have any idea how big that operation could be? I guess my question, I was going to go back to what I had said before. How do we know that you're not bringing in a thousand tons a day and 30% be recycled? So well, first, in yeah. the agreement, that wouldn't, mm -hmm. that doesn't count. Right. The county has full right to inspect all of our records to inspect the site at any time. Uh, not unaccompanied, obviously that's for uh, safety reasons that we'd want you to be accompanied. But you can, our records are open at all times per the agreement. Thank you. And again, you know, I think I had mentioned it last time, the permit both locally with Alamance County and with the state is what is valuable to us. We cannot be in business by violating that permit. So our goal is to always be in compliance, to go above and beyond. And by breaking the rules, that's not how we grow as a successful company. That's not how we are successful in the state of North Carolina and other states in which we operate. Um, one of the things I really like about a landfill is basically you're given a rule book. You're given a rule book by, by the state, by the federal government, and by Alamance County. And this is how you operate. And one of the things, discipline. I know we were talking about discipline in schools. Uh, I had a lot of discipline in schools uh, growing up, and we do follow the rules. Because if we don't follow the rules, we lose our permit. If we lose our permit, we lose our business. If we lose I, our business, we lose our jobs. Right. I just want to ask, Tanya, did I see? I'm right here. Okay. How did I miss you? I love your outfit. Um, I just know when Mr. Pike was here at our last meeting, they had to have a fence. They had to have a building with a ramp. They had, to, I mean, they really had a lot of um, requirements for them to open up to do the thing they're going to do. They're kind of in the same category, maybe sort of, kind of. Do you, do these folks, there's already a fence there? Is there already a building there? Or do they have to do that too? So these folks came under the old language in what was a separate heavy industrial. They're not in the new book. Mm -hmm. Since this existed way before that, they operate as is unless there's some major changes, not being ownership unless the business itself changes. So they are not under the same rule book as your last. Unfortunate for them, we just have land will come in, so y'all see right. that, but right. they're not under the same rule book. Well, like what Mary said earlier, from the state standpoint, I mean, it's a playbook, and they have a very stringent playbook that we've got to go by and adhere. And yeah. that, that's the last thing we're going to do is jeopardize any of that. I understand. Please, please don't think that anybody's picking on you. We're just, we're just, we got a whole lot of folks here that are for or against, and we have to listen to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say that none of the five commissioners live in this area. Mm -hmm. So see, it's not going to bother me a bit as far as what I'm going to see going up and down my road. Mm -hmm. When Smith School was opened across the street from me, it took it all the way to Mevin Street and it was like a drag strip. Burlington PD had to stay out there because I thought we're going to have a dead kid because everybody's like, God, I'm cut through now. It's just our nature. Mm -hmm. And um, the traffic, we've heard from another side out in the community as far as how that has been disruptive. Change is difficult. I say all the time it's like changing carpet in a Baptist church because I am a Baptist. I know how we get all the bit out of shape. But um, I have to think about that because people that live in the rural community want to do just that. If they wanted city life and busyness and all that, they would live where I live. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of like, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's just a lot of mixed emotions and I respect that from the people that I serve because that's who I work for. I don't work for me or these four gentlemen either. We all work for the public. And um, so that's why we just ask questions because the last thing I need to happen, and I thank you, Bill, for the questions you asked, is all of a sudden when it's stamped, approved, oh, by the way, did I tell you, we're going to land spaceships out there. I mean, and that's ridiculous, but we've seen this happen all across the country, and I don't want my county to be that way either. I, I mean, I, I just talked to Mr. Payne about, and I, I'm all over it, that train wreck in Iowa, Ohio. Mm -hmm. That could be us. We're, we're like the gathering spot of the world. Everything's a corridor. That's what we're defined as. And I think, are we, are we capable of handling something like that? Because, you know, their government has really let them down, and I don't want to be that kind of government. And so that's just why we're asking. I ask about a fence because if Mr. Pike has to have a fence, I think you should have a fence. But I don't want you to spend $2.5 million on a fence. I mean, because fences are extremely expensive, but 
I, I'm just about, you know, what's for one should be for all. And this grandfather stuff, um, you have to watch that too because you can, it's just, it's fair, but it's not fair. It just depends on who's talking about it. So that's the only reason we're asking these questions. I actually um, got a couple more and I'll be fair. I'm done. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to ask my lawyer a question. Sure. I mean, I just, just was looking at this. I just want to see what your opinion is. I can't find. And I looked quite a bit this weekend. I can't find, I'm gonna ask you, how many times has a state came in and overrode our county officials? How many times has that happened? I couldn't find it. Only if, if the county had excessively, had regulations that was too excessive. I saw a couple of those where the state stepped in and said, Okay, you can't do that. That's that's too excessive, and they gave the company relief. But I haven't found anything that wasn't excessive where the state came in and overrode what we decided. Uh, it almost makes me think that maybe we spent too much time on our Hydo ordinance, if that is possible. So I want to ask you: Do you think it's possible? Does this, does the does the states normally step in and override the county when it's not excessive? Um, I'm not really sure exactly what you're referring to in terms of an instance where that would happen. Well, I'm talking right, about, I'll put this instance in, in the realm of, okay, if... Are you saying if they comply if, with HIDO, would there be a circumstance where the state might then decide that that was... Well, I don't think they have to apply to HIDO because this, to me, looks like it's a... Uh, What's in the agreement that they'll comply with HIDO? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this, you don't think, I just was thinking, this is not a coattail to an existing landfill is what I'm, what I'm looking at. That's how I was approaching the problem. Is this a coattail for an existing landfill? If, and the reason I say this is because they, there's some things that Mr. Coble does now that they're not gonna do. And so it changes the, the, the sphere of their business. Because Mr. Coble, this is how I put it out. Mr. Coble's <coughs> business is more of a family business, like uh, I think Mr. Vine said this. Right. It's more of a family business, where this entity is a corporate entity right. that has different rules and regulations in their bylaws compared to a small business. Well, I think from the state's perspective, first of all, a lot of things have changed on the regulatory front in the last few years. Since 2017, the state has taken a much more active role and frankly has excluded local government from a lot of the regulation of landfill operations and the way that we do franchising. Um, so I can't speak to the robustness of state regulations and how often they audit and, and might shut down landfills for improperly complying with the state's requirements to operate, but I know they're robust. And I will say that from the state standpoint, they're licensed in the same way, regardless of the corporate structure that backs the entity in question. So whether it's a family operation, whether it's a corporate operation, they have to get licensed by the state in exactly the same way. So I, I will say that what I believe is gonna happen and what I've seen is possible here is that the license that currently exists in favor of Cobles is likely to be transferred to Meridian for them to continue to operate under the existing license until what point in time they might need to apply for a new one. And, and I'll be honest, that's about the extent of my knowledge and expertise on landfill operations and statutes. Um, I've come to speed on this in the last few months, uh, and it's, it's really complex and evolving. So if there's anything that I've said that might be incorrect, I'll let you speak to it. No, uh, but I can address, uh, we do have another C&D landfill within the state of North Carolina in Wake County. And in 2002, I am confident to say that we were inspected by uh, North Carolina DEQ at least five times. Yes. So they are actively involved, they're on site, they're testing everything from water quality to how we're covering the waste per our regulations, uh, inflow of truck traffic, safety, uh, all different measures. Um, we were successful there in expanding the geographic territory of that landfill as well as the um, annual cap tonnage. Uh, and uh, that's called Shotwell Landfill in Wake County, Raleigh Market area. Um, so obviously the state agreed that we were operating in a compliant and efficient manner and granted our expansion there. Um, we would bring our operational expertise to this facility. And yes, it's not operat operating at its height of the value of the asset 
at 600 tons a day. Again, you know, I don't hide that we are asking for 750 tons per day. But the asset that is there that is viable to Mr. Coble, as well as um, to the county in terms of your host agreement, uh, is, is an asset that is being underutilized. And all we're asking for is to utilize it, to expand it, and to help generate new revenue growth for the county for some of the projects that I heard earlier today that you have some very much needed funding for. We want to be a partner, but we do want to operate it as a business. Uh, we want to be very fair and transparent to you, and we want the county to be a partner with us. And we want Mr. Coble to be able to have an asset and, in America, be able to sell that asset. And we would like to buy it and operate in Alamance County for you all. And one other thing I'd like to add, too. As you saw, the host fee guarantee come year three was $100,000. And let's just say we put in more than that. You're going to get the greater of the two going forward for the life of the contract. Or life of the landfill, I should say. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lashley, what other questions do you have? Oh, I got three pages. Do you want to go through them all? Um, I, I looked at the I looked at the agreement and, and read it, and and I was going to ask my lawyer. It reads as a <coughs> new franchise. Okay, it is. That, that, it, that's it is my new with new with Meridian. I'll new with Meridian. They're they're new to us, and so for our because, perspective, it's a new agreement. The, because the way I looked at it, this was a transfer of Mr. Cobles to them. It's that's why I call it. That's why I call it a coattail effect. You're 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 actually. Well, it, Meridians can actually do this business by not having to meet uh, some requirements that that they would if it was a new entity. It's a uh, it, it's both. I know that sounds like a, a cop out answer, but it's both. So from perspective of their they're having to comply with the Hydro construction standard. Um, they wanted to comply with that because the site already exists. It's, it was built at a time before the HIDO existed. But they'll have to comply with the operation portion of HIDO because they're going to continue to operate the business as it exists in the site that it exists. If they expand the site, there may be some portions of HIDO that would have to be complied with at that point. But they'd also have to comply with the state requirements for cell development and expansion <coughs> at that point, too. Um, so in, in effect, it really is a little bit of both. Um, it's a new franchise agreement because we don't have an existing franchise with Meridian in any other fashion. So that it's new from that perspective. Uh, it's a continuation because of the fact that they're going to be operating the same site under a different corporate entity. Okay. Uh, fast forward. Okay. Meridian wants to get out of this. They want to get out. Not working out for them. They want to. Can they transfer? Yes. So another they can. They could. Yes. But the new entity would have to comply at least with the bare structure of the agreement that we have in effect. So whomever they might sell to would have to comply with this agreement, or we could remove, we could revoke the franchise at that point. Understood. Okay. I think I understand that. Okay. Hey, Bill. Yes. Um, talking about landfills in general, if the state changes a rule, um, I know for our other landfill, we've had to like, they may say, hey, you can close this, you're done, whatever. And all of a sudden, there's new materials they need to test for. They say, put a new well, they do, do do that. They change stuff all the time. Steve Carter's been with us in Raleigh, and like I said, last three or four years working with Richard on our landfills, they're like, we've changed the rules now. You got to do this. You got to do this. There's so many emerging things that, you know, if they say you have to do that, we do do that. I mean, it's, they can't say, hey, you said we didn't have to do it before. We've had to do that multiple, multiple times, just in reference to landfills, just to give you that information. So they change them quite a bit. Yes. Okay. But I can assure you never to make it easier. Oh, of <laughs> Always right. more regulation, not less. Yeah. That's yeah. true. So this well, is emerging, right. emerging chemicals and things. Just want to let you know that. You know, I'm going to stop because I haven't heard from Mr. Turner. But uh, if you run out of some questions, i got two pages. I have questions as well, but Mr. Turner, please. I'm, I'm fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, my questions are as follows. One, if this debris does not, and your debris is not contaminant, correct? Correct. It's not anything that requires a vinyl lining in the landfill. It's not anything that's going to seep into our water system or creeks and things of that sort. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What it is, again, it's construction and demolition debris. 
Now, oh. we are still responsible for monitoring the waste that comes in the site. We have spotters on site to make sure that certain materials, tires, things that people put in those open construction containers do not get buried. We have to pull that waste out. Uh, a a C&D landfill does have liners. They just aren't at the same capacity as a municipal solid waste liner. They're usually clay liners, rock liners, uh, other materials that are very highly regulated by the state, expensive to build the cells, just not as um, dense or expensive and regulated as the municipal solid waste landfill. Right, but our current county landfill is very expensive, does require super duper liners. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a leak, we run into that, it's extremely expensive. These materials that you're accepting that are not contaminants, otherwise are likely to go in our expensive landfill. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We see it as an opportunity for the county to save very expensive and valuable MSW uh, airspace by having that construction demolition debris, which by permit you're able to accept at your facility, but is not the best use of that asset that quite honestly is probably costing you well over a half a million dollars an acre to build uh, one, one acre of cell of your landfill. So you're saving and extending the life of our existing landfill? Yes, sir. All right. County attorney, if sir. we say no to this franchise agreement, can the state go around us and extend it and grant it on their own? Uh, yes. So I think that's one of the areas that is in flux in terms of the law, but I do think there's a method by which um, the vendor could pursue operations without a franchise. They could operate under the existing franchise agreement without pursuing a new one and then potentially at some point in the future pursue an amendment or a new permit with the state. Um, a few years ago, I think my answer to that question would have been somewhat different, but over the last few years, the state has taken a very different look at regulation of landfill operations by counties and other municipal governments. Particularly since 2017. Correct, yes. I and mean, several amendments even since that point. So like I said last time, it's really a done deal. I, I don't want to be that resolute, but I, I think that's not a totally unfair assessment. Grandfather, you're a conclusion under me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, me let me continue my questions if, if the board will allow. Uh -oh. So if we do, if we turn them down, they can go to the state and likely get this contract or franchise extended anyway. Now, question for county manager and county attorney, under this new contract, Meridian is giving to the county a lot that we are not likely to gain from the state. Is that correct? I think that's a fair assessment. So we either make the best out of this that we can or we turn it over to the state and just Katie bar the door. Maybe that's an overstatement, but uh, again, I'm back to, we have a really good contract, it's not perfect. And Mr. Lashley is correct, it goes well beyond the 25 mile current contract. But they are likely to gain this from the state and go around us if we say no. Um, They've even agreed to monitor the perimeter on the roads for trash and other debris beyond their complex. Uh, we're going to gain a number of dollars financially for the ge county general fund if we grant this, which isn't guaranteed in the state. Am I correct? Uh, correct. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Carter. As, as several of you have heard me say a number of times, that, that, was, that was one of my leading concerns as we presented this to our management to negotiate the contract, was come back with a deal that makes good sense for the citizens of Alamance County, but at the same time recognizes that we don't have to gain anything from it. So. I feel like we've probably done that, 
Um, and I hope that uh, I know I, I know since I'm absent today, I don't have a vote, but um, uh, I appreciate the line of questioning and I appreciate Bill's digging into this. Bill, Bill's he spends a lot of time making sure Valdez County are taken care of, and I know we all have that in our hearts. So I appreciate what everybody said so far this morning. Thank you. And Bill, if you have any more questions specifically for me, I'm, I'm happy to take those. I know you said you did. Um, well, since you ask, uh, my question is, I'll go back to what I was asking before, because I, you know, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find, we, you mentioned it, and Mr. Paisley mentioned it, that if we don't do anything, the state could step in and do whatever they wanted. Well, you know something? That's what we make guys like you for. If the state steps on our toes, we sue them. If they don't, if they want to come in and mess up what we decided that we want our county to look like, let's, let's play in a court of law, because that's where these things are settled. I understand the state has a little bit of, they're a little bit ahead of us that we have to sort of relent to them a little bit like the state versus the federal you know what they say well, i'm always happy to here. play um i like to play to win mm -hmm. and in situations where the state has said that the county lacks regulatory authority i'm not sure that we could present a cogent argument for the fact that we want to even with our high even with our high ordinance that we have in place correct okay is that is that the reason why to uh, do it? I I don't have a reason for or against doing this. I don't have a vote in that. Um, but I do think, like I said before, that because of the change in the regulatory scheme and an apparent effort to try to take authority away from local governments and shift it towards the state in terms of regulation, and I can't say why I think the state might have done that. Yeah. Uh, I will say that when I read the bill in question, it was titled something to the effect of an act to relieve the citizens of North Carolina from excess local government regulation. Exactly. So if that gives you an idea of what the state might have been trying to do or think about in terms of enacting that particular ordinance or bill, um, then I think that's that's worth thinking about. But I, I, I do think we're gonna have less authority to regulate if it countermands what the state says we should do. I think you read the same ordinance I did. That's what said, the language said it very, very similar. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other comments from commissioners or questions? Mr. Long, as I see you're sitting here, do you, do you wish to address this issue? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> then, then don't come forward. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the commissioners, I do want to let you know I'm prejudiced. I represent Mr. Coble, and it's in his best interest to sell at this point in time. We think we found a qualified buyer, a qualified business citizen who can operate the landfill, who is an expert in the landfill. You determined at your last meeting and presenting the, fast, the first leg of the ordinance that Meridian is a qualified person, qualified entity, if you will, to operate the landfill. So at this stage, you have the second chance to follow up on that qualification of the determination that Meridian is qualified and can operate it. The second stage is what you're addressing now with your questions, and that is your franchise agreement, which is the weeds, the nuts and bolts of the agreement, the business matters that reply. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thought you had a very good analysis of what the situation is. Uh, Mr. Lash, I certainly appreciate and understand what you've done, but I need to suggest to you uh, that it's kind of like you as a person who is interested in the welfare of the county citizens, but the state of North Carolina in this matter has preempted you. And the state, although that title to that act sounded real good, the purpose of it was just the opposite. The state wants to take over and make sure that landfills are uniformly regulated in the whole state of North Carolina the same. And it wasn't the same, it was different 
regulations among the counties. State didn't like that. The benefit to Alamance County that you have that the state so far hasn't stepped in is they still let you do an ordinance and a franchise and you get to collect fees. The state and other sections say, we're not gonna speak to that. That's the county matter between you and the operator. So all that that the chairman mentioned as to the fees is very good and it's far better than you've had in the past. You also have guarantees under this ordinance that the insurance is there for the operations for Meridian, <coughs> also for the closure of Meridian. And you have the situation that currently right now, uh, the Cobles didn't have, you couldn't get insurance back when this first got started. You had to put up cash bonds. Well, that's great. Cobles spent a lot of money on the premium. But you know, insurance companies like Zurich sometimes go broke. So that's the point I think that the regulations have improved. The insurance companies are regulated, somebody's looking over them. There's not that much regulation in the surety market, my friends. Now, the chairman mentioned the other factors as to the tonnage and he mentioned the Meridian Group going out and doing the extra work for us, beautifying the area and keeping it up as a good citizen on half a mile each side of the entrance. Well, those benefits and other benefits that they're offering are not required. They're throwing that in, so to speak. And I think because you have a franchise, you get the benefit of that, what I call the freebie. So from the Coles point of view, we would like to sell it. From the point of view of a citizen of Alamance County and what little I know about it and what I've studied, I think this is the best opportunity that you as the commissioners have because you get to say so about the monetary aspects. You get to say so with regard to what they call host fees, which goes into the general funds of the county. And the state's not gonna be able to butt in on that at this point in time. But in all the regulatory matters, the state of North Carolina has preempted you. And so you're making the best deal of what you have to work. And if you remember some of the things in the past, uh, you had hog farmers down east that had no regulatory situation. Well, the state has stepped in and preempted that field basically too. Ms. Thompson and I both have been on school boards before. I can tell you over the years, the state has preempted an awful lot of things that we as local boards don't have a say so anymore. You're just a eunuch. And you've heard me say it before. It's a funny situation when you feel like you, you feel like you should be able to control your own destiny in your own school system, but those above at the state level decided otherwise. So to be candid with you, if we as citizens and you as commissioners, and to answer Mr. Lashley's question, feel like that something's being overboard by the state or an overreach, the only situation I know as a resolution is go to the legislature. They're the ones that have adopted these statutes. They're the ones that have preempted the landfill situation. Now, in my closing statement, I'll point this out to you. You are already in the business of landfill. You know how expensive it is. Under your last decision I saw recently, uh, you've expanded the landfill potentially and are going to take C and D materials. Well, as someone mentioned a minute ago, the chairman, and also from Meridian's point of view, it doesn't make economic sense for the county to take C and D materials into your expensive, highly regulated landfill when C and D can go into a lesser facility at a lesser cost. And I think that's best for the citizens of Alamance County. So in my humble opinion as a citizen, I would hope y'all would approve this franchise arrangement with Meridian so that the county's long-term landfill will get longer life and not have exposure to having to take C and D. I'd also point out to you that I think it's good from your point of view that we all recognize and realize that this area of North Carolina and the future economic advancements that we've seen announcements for is gonna boom. And I don't think we can hide from that. It's on us, but I think it's good that you as commissioners through this franchise 
are looking forward to the growth of landfill entities as an owner operator yourself and then as a franchise or a C and D operation. I think this area is going to be booming. We're going to need those facilities. And I thank you if you would consider us favorably for the benefit of my client, Mr. Coble, so you can go home and get off his tractor. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Then I will make a motion that we grant a franchise to Meridian Waste North Carolina LLC for the disposal of construction and demolition debris and operation of a construction and demolition debris landfill. If we have no second, then we will move on. Do we have a second? Apparently we do not. Thank you. Hopefully you guys will still work with us when you get your state franchise. Madam Manager, yes, sir. do you want to take a break or do you want to go on? I'm willing to go on. The rest of the board? Ready to go on. Let's just do it. Okay, item 7B, resolution in support of the Eastern Piedmont North Carolina Home Consortium. Commissioners, I have Matthew Dolch here, the Executive Director of Piedmont Triad Regional Council, who will be presenting this item to you for your consideration. Matthew, thanks. Thank you, Heidi. Good morning. Mr. Chair and Board members, it's a pleasure to be before you again today. Hopefully I have uh, uh, an item of interest for you, for the citizens and for the county. Um, we are putting together uh, with several local governments um, a, a new home consortium. Um, Alamance County has been in a home consortium in the past. It was with Greensboro, Guilford County, and Burlington. Um, due to some changes that the city of Greensboro made as the lead in that, the county decided not to continue that relationship. And it opened up an opportunity for us to move together with a new configuration around that program. Just a quick reminder, the home program is under HUD at the federal level. Um, it, was read, uh, it was started in the Reagan administration as a way for um, smaller units of government to get direct funding from HUD because most HUD dollars go to big cities for big housing projects. Um, smaller units of government could form consortia membership of other local governments and receive direct funding from HUD for housing projects that they decided were important to their communities. Um, we've had one of those in the northwest part of our region for 28 years, and you were a part of the one with Greensboro. Um, a new consortium can be formed at any time. Um, the guidelines for those are they have to meet certain population standards and they have to be contiguous. We're currently talking to you and to several other local governments in our region about starting this new consortium. Uh, the possible members at this time are Rockingham, Ca uh, Caswell, Alamance, uh, Randolph, Davidson counties in the city of Burlington. Um, our concept is to have those counties in the city come together as members, uh, form a board, uh, put a consortium together, and then would uh, receive funding from HUD in 2014 with a new hunt, uh, funding cycle. Um, you have before your resolution, uh, honestly, it doesn't even have to be that formal at this standpoint. Our, our process is um, we've notified HUD that we're interested in forming this consortium. Uh, we have until the end of June for the members who decide to be a part to come together, negotiate a consortium agreement, and then that agreement would come before you for formal approval uh, before it was sent to HUD. So that would be kind of your final chance to look at it, see how it was put together and would be governed. Uh, and then decide up or down or whether you'd like to be a part of the consortium. We think with the, with the uh, configuration we have with all the members, I will tell you at this point, all the other members have expressed interest in moving forward and having the negotiation of the consortium agreement. It would bring in roughly $2 million a year for housing projects. Um, we would be the administrator at PTRC. 
uh, the city of Burlington would actually uh, be the consortium lead. The reason for that is that they currently already have a relationship with HUD. You have to be in their financial system. Basically what the lead does is uh, access money uh, when we need that from HUD for the projects. They're also the ones who are audited and responsible for any of the, uh, the monitoring visits that, that happen with the consortium. Um, with that roughly $2 million, all the members would come together and look at possible projects uh, and vote on those and decide where money would go year to year based on, on the needs and, and what projects come forward. I will tell you that um, with our current consortium, we work with for-profit, non-profit uh, uh, entities of various kinds, everything from um, Habitat for Humanity, where we have deals, uh, we would buy their construction materials and they provide the labor and, and build houses, uh, to for-profit developers who are uh, developing elderly housing, up to 50 units of elderly housing. Um, it's been a great um, situation for those counties, uh, very cooperative. Um, again, you would realize with $2 million, you aren't doing huge projects in every county every year, but based on the membership, which would, uh, if, the, if the members decided our, our current configuration with those folks is each county has two seats, they all come together, we bring projects forward, and they vote on where projects would be funded based on, um, on, on their needs at the time. It's a, been a great process for those counties. They developed about, they get about $600,000 a year in that consortium. Um, we've developed about a, a little over eight, 800 housing units in those counties um, and uh, have put a lot of great properties, quite frankly, on the tax books for those counties and met the needs of those citizens um, that the counties have brought forward. So that's all I'm asking for today is really the okay from you folks to allow your staff to come move forward into negotiations on a consortium and then probably at the beginning of June, um, with agreement of all the members, we bring a consortium agreement for you to consider. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Well, as a new board member, I, I can't say enough great things about PTRC. This is just one of the many opportunities, federal grant, big <coughs> money that's possibly out there for all kind of other projects, but um, it's, been a, it's been a gift for me to be part of this. So I can't support this enough, really. I appreciate that. I have no questions. But thank you for what you yes, sure. This is an old member of PTRC. I would echo Commissioner Thompson's comments. I think this is a great opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And I'm an old member of that yes. as well. <laughs> and I, I say folks don't want to stay with us long, but. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I've got a question for Matt. I just was curious to find out um, how is the power of the funds appropriated among the counties and the consortium? Yeah, so what we do currently, and again, honestly, that will come down to the membership. And so every dollar that's spent is approved by the consortium board, and that would be, I said, in our current configuration, that's two appointees per member uh, that make those decisions. Um, a for-profit or non-profit developer would come to us, or a county or, or a city would come to us about a possible project. We as staff would package that and try to make that work and then bring that to the board and they give it an up or down um, uh, on whether they'd like to see that, that funded. Um, you know, it's a, a, a great example is you know, we're working right now um, in Mount Airy and we're developing a 20 bed uh, opioid transition house up there and they're using some home money for that and the county had some opioid funds they wanted to put in and they also have a nonprofit that's willing to, to run that. Um, and so that was all the members coming together and deciding that would be a great resource that multiple counties could use uh, and they decide to fund that project. But um, the, all the funding decisions come from the members. Um, we don't have any say over what projects are funded. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Do we have a resolution to present? I believe it's in your packet. <laughs> Okay, if nobody else will, I'll resolve that we support the Eastern Piedmont North Carolina Home Consortium. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank and you. Thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. the opportunity to give us to work with you and look forward to that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. York. Yes, Commissioners, this next item is your courthouse renovation project just being brought back for informational purposes. 
you received an update at your February 20th meeting on this and the board had requested some analysis of the needs for space from the judicial partners including the scheduling and the use of the courtrooms so we're just bringing this back for uh, discussion and direction I believe David Taylor is here as well from CRA Associates if there are questions that we can answer for you uh, I had I had a couple comments uh, Madam County Manager uh, we, we did ask for some information about the, the operations of the courthouse, how that flows, what courtrooms are used. Um, I understand we got some information about the current use of the current facilities. Uh, I think what we haven't seen, though, is taking that to the next step, which is uh, what I mentioned at the last meeting. If you, if you assume we have a fifth district court judge, which is likely if we have the space to, to put that individual um, how would the flow look in the new building as as currently designed and we don't have obviously architectural plans but just kind of sort of bubble plans on how we might allocate space use I think it might be helpful for mr. Taylor's team to take this information put it in the in the court space that they have they have drawn out and then bring that back to us to say how this might work on a Monday through Friday okay. um, schedule typical Monday through Friday schedule so we know in the current spaces is there any overlap is there is there any extra space uh, what space is there to grow for the future I think that would really be helpful to this board in understanding what the needs are currently and then how those needs might be met in proposals that we're speaking about um, I understand that you know this it was a comment this morning that that a lot of people are just are just now realizing that we're talking about courthouse expansion of course we've been talking about it for for more than a year but um, we haven't been ready to take a vote and so when you when you get ready to take a vote things become more concentrated things become more focused and people tend to know about things that well, they haven't paid attention in the past um, but I also think that there's there's time to take a deliberate pace uh, make sure everybody's up to speed which is why this board has has taken time to make sure that the school system through the operational review I mean the oversight committee kind of review committees had a chance to look at the various options and I even said last meeting I think there's some opportunity to, to tweak some of these models uh, in terms of payment um, but that's why we've I think we've taken a deliberate pace so that everybody in the community is up to speed everybody can weigh in on where they think this ought to uh, ought to land so I think if we bring back at the next meeting or, or in the next series of meetings whatever the process needs to look like to allow for us to analyze the space that's available and then also talk more about financing once maybe once the school folks uh, have had a chance to look at more specific numbers okay I'm just curious whenever um, I was on the ABS as Board of Education boy we sweated blood and tears to get the bond 150 for ABSS and a little shy of 40 for ACC and as someone who's walked those halls and come to a county commissioner meeting when you filled in and David was your chairman, remember? Because you got one of those invitations. I made this really petty little invitation with a school bus on it and presented it to all of them and asked them if they would get on a school bus with me to go look at the buildings instead of reading a cost report. Because what's on paper is kind of like hiring somebody. You just don't read their resume and go, oh my God, they could be like bin laden's first cousin i'm not saying he's a bad guy but um i'm just saying you really have to go see and get the effect of water pouring out of a ceiling into buckets where kids are trying to walk around you have to get the effect of opening up a third grade classroom door at grove park and pulling behind the door and there's the entire computer wire system right there out and open for everything i mean there's so many things you could also get the effect of when i first come on the board um, I would go to turn time because my children were part of that school system too and I don't know how many teachers have had <coughs> nasal surgery because of the black mold that was around the windows who have yet to be replaced but yet we did a $747,000 bridge to nowhere in the back for kids to walk across because it was unsafe once they started checking the other one. I mean it can go on and on and ABSS is far from having their stuff fixed because of not getting all to it all the time there's so many sites and i mean it's just unbelievable wear and tear on buildings with all children and everybody else coming in out for years and years and um it, it just it amazes me how that had to be voted on 
because taxpayers pay for that. And I think the thing about what uh, Mr. Stewart was talking about with the sales tax, the word tax was associated with that versus bond. It's all taxpayer money. It just doesn't drop out of the sky, kind of like grants. Grants are free money. No, they're not. They're coming from all of us in a sense. It's just different requirements. And when I know all this stuff still exists, I'm not, I am not going to put that behind another building to be built. I'm just not, regardless of what the needs are, what the wants are, and everything else. And uh, I know what's still out there, which you go to East Long, take a left and go up the ramp, and there's a teacher there that's got a bookcase in the corner, and she showed me, because me and Patsy were the board members they'd tell on. Boy, we had moles all across this county. I'm just going to tell y'all, and I still got them now as a commissioner. You move that bookcase, black mold. She kept a spray bottle of Clorox too in there every other day to spray that. And at the bottom, it was open and you could see the grass. Go around the back of East Lawn and you got this much space where center blocks are out. It's just typical of stuff that gets wear and tear. We probably got the same stuff in our county buildings because it takes so much money and upkeep. And that money comes out of our pockets. It's just not falling out of the sky, kind of like COVID money did. And we're running out of COVID money and we think about all the ESSER, they want to call a different name that ABSS used to fix all their HVACs. And it amazes me how our breathing air is so much more important now post-COVID. We could breathe this crap before, but now we're going to get all this magical money to fix all this breathing, and we still got where we need to fix the breathing because of our lungs take on stuff. Lord help us going to come out of these. I'm all over at Ohio derailment and the way our government has really screwed those people. I don't want us to be those kind of people. And um, I just, um, I know I know we need things. I know we do, we need all kind of things. But um, I just want us to really be smart and think, would we have the support of this community if we put this courthouse money on a ballot and voted for it that way? Because the same people that's paying for the school bond are gonna be paying for this. And I think that's their right. I really think we all need to look as a community just like what we just did with Meridian. I don't have one doubt these people are not pros. They're just top pros. They're wonderful. They're kind. And they mean everything they say. But I don't want to put fees of $100,000 in, what, four years up against all those trucks coming in and out of that community that's going to really disrupt that community. I know we need things, but I'm going to always weigh the side of the citizen against stuff like that. Alamance County, wake up. We've got to do zoning, or we're going to be facing this all the time. We've got to, get, we've got to be really adults here and make sure we do this, do this right. But um, that's how I feel about it. And I'm not going to change my mind about this courthouse. I've been married to a lawyer for 35 years. He's practiced law for 45 years. I know how the ins and outs of court go. Everybody's in and out of the courthouse. It's, and we just keep on with crime. I was at the Governor's Crime Commission last week. I sent Scott my emails and my presentations by um, Go Governor Easley's son. He's really sharp about um, gangs and Lord, how mercy, how they're recruiting motorcycle gangs, the cartel is, to bring all this stuff in here and just literally just kill us. Juvenile crime, the rates of it, uh, it's just one thing after, you know, they recruit younger kids that are, hadn't got any felonies tacked on them because they raised the age and they can get the guns for them and they're going to be, it's a big deal. These people are brilliant. They're evilly brilliant. And that's who we're facing. And um, we just got to open our eyes to a whole lot of things and who we're putting our resources into. I'm all about prevention. You still have to make a choice to make the right choice. That you can't pay, you can't legislate evil and you can't pay bad out of people. It's got to be a choice. So, um, and I'm, I respect any commissioner what you feel about this because we're all different. And, but yet we're always going to do what's right for the citizens. That's why we are elected to put the hearts and minds of the citizens first. And um, that's it. And I'm probably the only one that will be a Lone Ranger, but I don't mind. So is Jesus. And I think he's got good company. Chris Lash. Well, um, I'll just, you know, looking at this, I, I made a comment to one of my friends that um, I wish this um, courthouse could just push it off for three months. And the reason being is we've got so much, not so much on our plate from a county standpoint, but we're revaluing. We have no idea what our rate's going to be. 
So, you know, like you said in the last meeting, there were a couple of things that you showed. Hey, look, don't look at the 1.63 cents. Look at the real number because that's where it's going to fall. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe we should um, really – I like what Mr. Turner asked. I think it was a great question. Um, it, it would sort of like give you an idea of how we are sitting right now, even before the building's built. Uh, what extra space would we have? Um, do we need a fourth floor? There's a lot of questions that will be answered by that information. So I'm one of these folks, like, I think that uh, maybe we'll, why don't we just hold off a little bit until we, uh, I think it would be a whole lot easier on the board, a whole lot easier on the taxpayers to let's get our reval done, let's get the tax rate done, let's, let's we have to pay, base our budget on that, and then on July 1st, that's when the gun goes off. That's when the decision needs to be made. Uh, is it going to hold off on construction? Yeah, three or four months. But it, I, in my in my estimation, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it might take three months to get CRA to take care of their stuff that they want to do. It might be three months before you even have any idea of how this building's going to look, where it's going to be, uh, and all the particulars involved. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. But it just makes me think that we have so much on our plate and we're trying to get so much right. We have expanded our place to be very wrong. Where right now we have a really small uh, opportunity to be wrong because of uh, the new budget. We know what we want to put in. And what I don't want to do is I, th I have a feeling that this construction on the new courthouse is being taken care of right now because uh, of the revaluation. When you have numbers that are going to come down our tax rate, the way it's got 65 cents now, it's going to come down to the mid 40s, maybe the low 40s. That's when you could actually have a whole lot of increased spending and it not look like it. Oh, uh, you know, we increased uh, spending from um, from you know taking away the uh, the, the, the the school boards, um, the ABSS funding. Well, you know, I just want to remind everybody in this room that never was the eight cent sales tax be a determinant for increased spending for schools. What you have done is you have installed a, a tax, a school tax that the voters didn't vote for. And what that eight cents was done for was it was put in place so we could figure out how much money that we were going to need to pay for this bond that the voters had voted for. And then for three years, our taxpayers were charged an eight cents tax rate. And that we were told by previous county management that that was done because we were going to pay as we go. Does anybody in this room, did anybody in this room see a, a, a decrease of $150 million? Did we go to the bond market and say, okay, we taxed the taxpayers for three years and we're going for $150 million for ABSS, but because the taxpayers have spent this money for three years, we're going to go to the bond market and get $125 million. Anyone see that? Absolutely not. And then now that the $0.08 cent tax is in there, we have folks who want us to give all that money to the schools when it was never theirs to start with. Never. It was never posed to the taxpayers, hey, we're going to install this $0.08 cent tax, and it's going to go on forever, and the schools are going to get all this money. It was never intended for that, and this is one of the things that was done outside of how we normally take care of our finances. It's my, my recollection that we go at it, it goes in the unrestricted fund, and we spend it from there. If it's designated for schools, it's the 40, 42 tax buckets, those are things that the school system gets for their capital needs. And, I might say, the taxpayer of Alamance County also gives the school system $3.3 million in capital needs each and every year. And I think I've spoke to some of the school board members. That's not going away. That's something that I think that the taxpayers have said that we want to do going forward. Now, if you have roofs that are leaking, I hate to say this, but if you've got roofs that are leaking, that's an indictment of the maintenance team. Because roofs don't go bad in a day. Roofs don't go bad in a month. Roofs don't go bad in a year. It's a, it's a long-term process. So I think if that's happening in the school system, that's an indictment on the maintenance team. And also, I'd like to remind everybody and the people watching that the taxpayers of Alamance County are only required to maintain the buildings. That's all we're supposed to do. And that's what I think 
as commissioners, that's what we want to do. We want to take care of the schools. We want to make sure. But I also want you to understand something. Did you see the gentleman who came in here this morning? How the, uh, uh, a, a Burlington School finances their school system? River Mill Academy, you see how they finance their school system? They're not, they're not having these issues with, you know, we gave the school system $8.2 million last time for capital needs, top 10 projects. We funded seven of them because we thought that's what needed to be done. But we look at other entities and how they're run. And we, we, we pose those and we put those next up to the, uh, the, the school system when we see that the school system's got a failed model. And this eight cents is just gonna increase that failed model because that eight cents was never ever intended to go, the 5.64 cents was never ever intended to go to the school system for eternity. It was just set up so we could figure out how to finance these bonds. And now that we know Right, Ms. Evans, now that we know what our bill is going to be each and every year on this bond, we know what our bill is. So therefore, the eight cents tax should go away. It should just go back into our general fund. It should go back into the way we normally collect taxes and how we pay them out because we have the money that we need to finance the school bond. And that's where we are at this point by saying that, you know, I just did a couple of calculations when we were talking. Over those three years, the county taxpayer spent over $33 million for this school bond, and I can't see where they got a break. I never can see where we got pay go, where we, we asked the bond market, well, we only need, we don't we don't need 150 now, all we need is 120. That never happened. And that's why I'm saying this eight cents needs to go away. This eight cents just needs to be brushed off because we have figured out how much our bond payment's gonna be. We know how much the bill's gonna be, and we need to take that money and pay the bond, and then whatever's left over comes in the coffers is to benefit the taxpayer. Now, I probably went off on a tangent there, but uh, I think I got everything in that I wanted to say. Mr. Turner. I'm good, Mr. You're good. I would indicate that uh, Judge Overby gave us a printout on usage of courtrooms and things of that sort. Uh, so we county commissioners now have that in front of us. Which we asked them to provide. Yeah. Which we, and, and they did. They did a good job. I don't have anything else. Let's go to item 7D, please. All right, commissioners, this is the uh, financial plan. You had asked at your last meeting for us to provide an additional funding scenario that would allow for the fourth floor of the courthouse, which would increase that project from 67 in your current model to 75 million. Uh, so I have that scenario in here for your information. And the board had also asked that staff share the financial model and the options that the board was looking at with the financial oversight committee that has also been completed. So this is just bringing uh, the same information that you had received. I believe the school board also discussed um, the various models and we did want to clarify uh, as Commissioner Lashley said that the capital 3.3 million would remain unchanged that goes to the ABSS uh, annually the sales tax uh, is not adjusted in any way in the model that remained constant it would simply be the 5.64 that was previously allocated to fund uh, the bonds we needed to update the model with the new value of the penny. The interest rate that was used uh, on the bonds was estimated at 5%. We know that that came in much, much lower. So we're just updating the model <coughs> to reflect the current trends. Well, and I think that's important to note. I mean, you know, there may be some confusion in the, in the community about what it exactly it is that we're considering. We're not talking about taking money out of the ABSS's capital reserve fund. Correct. We are talking about reallocating future revenue streams. Correct. That were designed years ago on some assumptions, some of which have changed. That is correct. You mentioned sales tax. One of the assumptions, as I understand, in the in the capital funding model for ABSS is that sales tax would come in at eight million. Is that right? That's right. The, the baseline was set up for an $8 million understanding that money from sales tax into the ABSS fund would be $8 million. Yes. The first year it came in around 9, second year around 10.5. It's projected this year to be around 11.3. Correct. 
Correct. projections. So that's that's money that's going into that fund. I mean, this year around three million dollars over what's what's in the model. That's correct. Which means it's just it's just indicating that that in addition to the value of the penny growing, in addition to the fact that <coughs> the interest rates that we're spending on that money is lower than what was initially projected. It means that the fund is growing higher at a quicker rate than it was planned to grow. Correct. And we can have a, a discussion about the policy around how much should stay in ABS as this fund. We can have that conversation. And maybe, maybe it's all of it. Maybe it's none of it. Maybe it's something in between. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, what we're talking about, the technical review committee process, the oversight committee process. There is a number that we can three people can come to terms with on where that number should be. And it's important to have that discussion. And some people might say all of the money needs to go in there, but I think um, it's growing quicker than it was designed to do. Mm -hmm. And now I think we, we need to look at what's an appropriate amount to continue to do the high priority items that this ABSS needs. I'm for that, I've always been for that. Um, we funded, what, $8 million in additional projects that, that's funded and have and when they don't have a contract to get to, to get done. So, I mean, there's, there are projects in line that are waiting to get done. Those should fix those roofs. If there are additional high priority items, come talk to us, ask for the money. Um, because as I understand it, there's, even, if we, even if we did do some reallocations, there's still money in capital reserve fund at the end of this year that could be used to fund additional projects. So that's a conversation we need to have, but we need to have a conversation about the actual facts. We need to know what the actual numbers are going to grow to if we change the allocation. Uh, and, and what they want. And, and the, I encourage uh, and welcome that conversation as we get more information about this project. Mr. Thomas. I don't say stuff. Steve, just chimed in. Mr. Carr. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just, uh, one of the points I, I, I think I want to reiterate something that I think Craig just said. Uh, when we allocated those funds for ABSS, the, the intent was to allocate the money to make the payment on the bonds. And what we did, we, we accidentally, accidentally I guess, I don't know how, it, how else to say it, we used a fractional penny instead of the dollar amount. And what we need to do, and that portion of the money being allocated to ABSS was intended to be to cover the debt for the ABSS portion of the bond. It's grown. <clears throat> Ms. Thompson, any comments? Ms. Lashley. Uh, I'd just like to just reiterate, you know, the difference between um, the, the funding of the schools. You know, the taxpayers, like I said, we're just supposed to maintain the schools. Well, we don't pay the teachers. I mean, the taxpayers are, do give the uh, teachers a, a, a gift by giving them a supplement, an increase in their supplement. Um, but I think that if you look at how different, take the gentleman who came in today, about the $6 million he was looking for his first school. That's how, the, that's how private schools fund their stuff. And it just seems to me that private schools have a tendency to take a look at their finances and look a little more stringent on them. I was at a school board meeting for River Mill a couple months ago, and they allocated uh, $238,000 to buy two new buses. They didn't have to borrow the money. They have it. So I'm just thinking, look at the, um, just look at what the Alabama County taxpayer provides for the, for the school system, and they're going to pay the bill each month for the bond like it was designed to, like you said, Mr. Mr. Turner, that's exactly what it was designed to do, and now we know what the bill is, we can go ahead and make that payment. And I would suggest to scrap the balance, because basically what you have had done here, and not you, not saying you, but the last county management staff basically installed a school tax on our citizens. It was never designed to be that way. It was designed to give enough money to pay the bill each year. And I think now that that 5.64 cents has come to fruition and we have done a good job managing the finances of the county that our tax base increases, we should understand that we should take that 8 cents away and it should just go back to the we should just fund the way we normally do it. That was an, ex that was an uh, extreme kind of thing for the board to do, to come in to set an eight cent tax rate for 
uh, before we even went to the bond door to get the money with taxpayers paid a long time for that so I think you know once again we should take a look at the taxpayers and just uh, look out for them and just let's get rid of this eight cents because it's it's it, it was it was designed for a certain way and it's taken care of that so let's look at our bond payment and like you said mr. Turner that bond payment uh, goes up each and every year and basically uh, maybe I should ask a simpler question uh, if someone handed you an eight million dollar bill are you going to pay that 9.4 no the logical question the answer would be no so why are you asking the taxpayers to do that um how many school sites is it 37 or 38 with eight with ctec 38 so it's not one school just it's not one school it's that many schools across this county way out or right in the middle with all kind of issues um they're old I and mean, they're new they're old i remember smith had to get one end done with the foam stuff that you lift up the foundation because the ground was sinking that's just called construction stuff that's just called normal we see that all the time and uh, and that's with the county it was any business i mean it's just wear and tear on stuff and um and i i, I certainly hope that nobody in this room thinks that a 150 million dollar bond while you're building a high school on a hundred acre plot for 67 million uh, was going to let everything else left out of that 150 to fix while you're adding on to all your high schools Pleasant Grove and South Mevin it, it didn't take but a second and um, and with all the other needs that are part of that maybe the past leadership was thinking about maybe for once we can get it all done and get it fixed instead of coming back here and pleading and begging uh, whoever is on this board of commissioners because i've been in this <clears throat> business since 2012 and i have watched the school board come in here because i was the person that watched it and and just the attitude between the two boards like you know like oh we own this no we own this none of us own it the taxpayers own it that's who foots the bill for this so we don't need to get all like we got all this government problems and powerful we can tell each other what to do we need to work together because it's about kids and kids are really taking a bad rap nowadays with the stats that's going on with children and all the stuff facing them and all the crime facing them two years of covid really done a number covid uh on our children but um you know i know we're all coming from different areas and i respect those areas that's what makes this board work because we're all different but sitting on the board of education and hearing about and seeing all the stuff that they needed and stuff that they could have done better and stuff that they have done better just like the commissioners we can learn from each other all the time as well um, we just we just can't think that one single bond is going to just like be a pot of gold and it's just going to fix every need we have because one charter school which i respect them all they do a good job does not have over twenty thousand people in it or a staff in it or all kind of stuff in it they're different that's what makes them good when i was at bronson day school we didn't get squat from nobody except the parents we had something called great escapes every year we would get in there and raise money somebody donate a car and we'd all bid on it that's the first time I've ever been on a Bahama trip. <laughs> my husband said, well, I'm having sharp pains going down my arm because I was just waving that flag. I don't need to do auctions. So I get carried away. And But I watched the parents, only the parents, raise $85,000 in one night, and that was to go toward the extras. And I'm so proud of them for building. I knew BCA would be the first one to go all the way to high school because they had the, the people behind them. you got to have that want. And um, whenever I see now this county side of bond for ACC as well, that tells us where education rates and um and we've took a hit in education and we got to do what we can but i'm gonna tell you what when you walk in a school building i remember this with cummins because i got the title of being little blue paintbrush those paint contractors todd thorpe will tell you were two to three months late cummins got out of school and it was a mess because they had to put everything in the middle get everything out of the way so they could paint and when they opened Cummins, they still were like that. Imagine being a kid, imagine being a teacher, walking back into your school thinking it's going to be all painted, it's going to be, everything's going to look better. And it's still the same. I went over there, ceiling tiles were lift. It was a hot mess to the, I mean, I got pictures. Oh, I got pictures. And it took forever. Bruce Benson and Brian Feely and me and Patsy went over there and just wrote a broom over there going, this is unacceptable for teachers to walk out of school thinking this is going to be okay and they're going to even a bigger mess. I think our teachers and our kids deserve better. I think we don't, we don't do that in our own lives. We don't come in here in a mess. 
And I mean, but yet the county taxpayer pays for that. We all pay for it. I'm a county taxpayer. And I want it done right, not half, hmm, what some people say. And that's why sometimes, like the old courthouse, we talked about that. Wasn't it the jail? Wasn't your jail kind of messed up? Wasn't there a stair steps or nothing gum? You want to get that low price, you get that low standard. I don't know why we think we have to get the lowest price because that's what we're going to get is the lowest standard. Cheap doesn't always work out. So um, I, just, I just think we need to just think big picture here and, and not rob Peter to pay Paul. And I know this is a new pet project. And I know it's, it's coming and, it's, and that's fine, but um, all of a sudden you got this and then, well, we're done with you. Good luck, we're gonna put it on something else. And we, don't, we need to finish things and we need to finish them right so that everybody knows that's the kind of leadership we have is we're gonna make sure it's done right, not have to go back and refix it again. And I mean, I, I, I got a little bit of a bias because I was on the school board and they didn't do things I liked either. Trust me, I was a big complainer, kind of like now. And um, so, but I want it done right because I think I think that third grader deserves to breathe really good air, and I think his books need to be right, and he don't be out. I think he needs to have it all. I think just like that high school senior, they got screwed out of their sports, they got screwed out of their prom, they got screwed out of everything during COVID. You wonder why suicide rates in teens is three times what it used to be. That's it. Everything has an effect, and we need to think about effects. And there's more to people. There's more to everything than money. If you think you're gonna fix things with just money then we all need to step down because we had a lot more problems going than just our dollar signs. And, um, and I know I'm just rattling and nobody agrees with me, but you know what? I don't care. I'm going to stand beside the kid all day long and that's all that matters. My legacy would be a cupcake and a kid on my tombstone. That'd be just fine. So don't ask me if I got anything else to say because I don't. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, except for me. It's had an opportunity, and I'm going to waive my opportunity. Let's move to 70 <laughs> Chamber of Commerce. Sure. All right, Commissioners, we have a new agreement with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm sorry, say that again. We have a new agreement with the Chamber of Commerce for the uh, economic development. Uh, of the county. And so part of the agreement is a quarterly report that uh, the chamber provides to me. And so we wanted to take the opportunity to have this first quarterly report presented to the Board of Commissioners. So that's what we're here to do. And uh, Ms. Reagan Girl will uh, introduce her report to you. Good morning, commissioners. I had to check to make sure it was still morning. Uh, it is, I can report. So uh, good morning, I'm Reagan Gurrell, president and CEO of the Alamance Chamber and commissioners. It's a pleasure to be with you on this beautiful spring Monday morning. The Alamance Chamber is proud to provide economic development services for Alamance County government and Alamance County businesses. Our public-private partnership over 15 years has resulted in many successes. Alamance County is fortunate to have an industry-leading economic development team that works in harmony with each other and our businesses. Before we dive into industrial recruitment data and successes, I wanted to share our inclusive, uh, inclusive approach to economic development. The Alamance Chamber is committed to small business and entrepreneurial development, talent and workforce, job creation, and community visioning. I want to highlight a few key components of each of those areas. Oftentimes, access to financial resources uh, is the strongest barrier for our small businesses when they're looking for growth and development. The Recovery Loan Fund was created to address needs of local businesses during COVID-19, uh, which has now transitioned to a revolving loan fund uh, that's expanding accesses, access for businesses in need of a business loan. In 2022, our Director of Small Business and Entrepreneurial Development interacted with more than 33 local small businesses. We've never tracked that number before, so we're pretty proud of that. The Chamber continues to be committed to talent and workforce development through our support for the Career Accelerator Program, our participation in the Eastern Triad Workforce Initiative, and through community development. The Chamber supports job creation through business recruitment, existing industry services, strategic product development, and investment in infrastructure. 
The chamber plans to lead a community visioning process designated to generate consensus built strategies for addressing livability factors such as education, housing, cultural, art, cultural arts, health, transportation, and community aesthetics. As you hear, the chamber is working every day for the benefit of economic vitality for Alamance County. It is now my pleasure to introduce David Putnam, Senior Director of Economic Development, to share more um, data and, and um, stats with you. David. I'll say no is both. Yes, it's both. Our state magazine front page, I'm telling you. Yeah, so um, for those of you, uh, well, first off, uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, for allowing me an opportunity to get up here and join you. Um, so there was a reference earlier about the bow tie. Uh, we're joking that my new trail name is going to be bow tie. I just got over a weekend hiking the Appalachian Trail. So I'm also a little stiff because of that. So if you see me waddling around, that's what it is. Um, I'd, I would just like to kind of run through this report that we've prepared for you uh, today. And then certainly this is the first, as County Manager York uh, um, mentioned this is the first of many to come and so certainly if you guys would like to see any revisions and how we present it um, any you know punch points you guys want us to really hone in on uh, by all means please you know offer that and we'll curate this to fit that need um, but to start I'll just run through kind of industry announcements over the past five years that the chamber has played a part in uh, and we'll start with industries recruited um, so the Alamance Chamber um, in the past five years has helped recruit UPI, which resulted in a $17 million uh, capital investment, 39 jobs. FlexOst, $4.2 million capital investment, 47 jobs. UPS, $262 million investment, 451 jobs. Uh, Chick-fil-A Supply Company, $52 million investment, 160 jobs. Uh, no Living, $3.7 million investment and 24 jobs. Sunlight Batteries, $40 million investment, 200 jobs. Stereotech, $71 million investment and 50 jobs. Now we're starting to hit ones that you guys might be familiar with. Um, Cosmo IND, it's what I would like to call a discrete project that we were able to recruit to Alamance County without using public incentives. Um, and then Revere Copper which is also a discrete project that we we're able to recruit to the county without using local incentives. Uh, industries expanded. Honda Power Equipment, $10.5 million uh, capital investment. Lotus Bakeries Expansion 1, $17 million investment. National On Demand, $1.1 million investment. Sandvik Corment, uh, 82 jobs. Lotus Bakeries 2, $62 million investment, 90 jobs and Lotus Bakeries 3, $84 million investment and 62 jobs. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention, this quarterly report, we're not through the first quarter of this year yet, so it does only capture the period of performance, which is 7-1-2022 up to December 31st, 2022. Um, so our next report out, there will be more relevant and recent information. Other data I'd like to point out uh, in terms of project engagement, a project is what we would call something that's either, um, you know, a, a project lead or an industry lead, something that either our team develops, so you guys might find a lead, other citizens in Alamance County might offer leads to us. Um, we would call those projects and the state might offer a lead. So of all the leads that we had generated uh, in that period of performance, um, from uh, 7 one to December uh, 31st, 22. We had 40 companies that we interacted with and projects, uh, 32 manufacturing companies, seven life science or biotechnology companies, and one office clerical company. Uh, so pretty good volume of traffic. Uh, and I've heard in the past, this is the most inundated we've been. Obviously, I'm a relatively newer staff member at the chamber, um, but uh, I'm really proud of what our team's doing and how we're able to move the needle on all the great work. Um, product development, which is an important part of economic development. If you don't have product, you don't have you know, that economic development currency to offer to industries. 
So we helped uh, apply for a Golden Leaf site program, uh, which is kind of a, a site readiness program that the Golden Leaf Foundation offers. Uh, we continue to investigate uh, potential transload rail facilities in Alamance County. This would be a competitive asset that we can leverage to our advantage that would not use, um, you know, as m it, it would be a competitive asset to levy in lieu of public incentives in the future. I would just say that. It's an infrastructure investment. Um, meeting with a variety of development groups, uh, about 10 right now, about opportunities across the county. Because of our centrally located position in North Carolina and proximity to you know, the Piedmont Triad area and the Research Triangle Park, um, we kind of form this bow tie right in the middle. Uh, so we are very uh, development driven county uh, versus other counties. Um, some of them are less so developer driven uh, and have more personal property owners that are able to see the vision of economic development and work with a local economic development unit and uh, advertise their property. Well, because of our central location proximity to that 4085 corridor, we are very developer driven. Um, so working with those developers is a very important tool. Uh, supporting other property owners, including developers, through the NC Certified Sites Program, uh, which we're very proud that NC Department of Commerce has rebooted. Uh, and as of, uh, again, that performance period, our total square feet available included 3.5 million square feet of industrial space and one point, excuse me, 1,877 acres of uh, just land ready for industrial development. Um, as far as marketing goes, we've uh, developed the Alamance Chamber marketing flyer for eligible properties. That's if, you know, a personal property owner wanted their property to be listed or advertised to potential industries. They might want to see a catalytic or transformative project. We've developed a tool to allow them to present their property to you know, these industry opportunities and projects. Um, we've updated the Alamance Chamber's website to have relevant economic development information. We're currently updating the Newcomer's Guide to Alamance County in collaboration with other local entities. Uh, we're preparing a launch campaign for the existing industry program we are starting to call Alamance Growth, or excuse me, Access Growth. Uh, and we've attended and recruited industries at the 2022 Battery Show up in Novi, Michigan. And as far as workforce development, talent development's a very key part of economic development. Um, we've participated in CAP steering committee meetings. We've participated in regional workforce development board meetings. Carolina Across 100s, uh, our state, it's an hour, excuse me, it's an hour state, our work program targeting opportunity youth, those 16, those age 16 to 24 that are not in school and not working. You know, how do we activate that talent that's right there in our community and get them engaged? Um, we're preparing, um, I lost my place. <clears throat> We've prepared industry partners uh, opportunities to connect with um, the local community college and NC Commerce's new Assistant Secretary for Clean Energy. Uh, and we've co-hosted the 2022 Apprenticeship Graduation and Signing Ceremony. In small business, uh, a space that we're increasingly and actively engaged in, we've participated in monthly meetings for the Triad Small Business Consortium, uh, including participating in monthly meetings for the Mebbin Business Association, uh, monthly meetings for the Alamance Rotary Club, and then monthly meetings for the Women's Resource Center. We've hosted the Alamance Entrepreneur Networking event as well. Um, and in addition to that, three individual and independent business networking events, offering entrepreneurs a place to meet and um, you know, share their ideas with one another and interact with one another is an important part of that ecosystem that we're trying to help foster. Um, we've supported uh, Alamance Community College's search for a qualified SBC director, and uh, we're glad that that position is now filled. Um, and then we've offered uh, one financial resource proposal for a growing business in Mebane. And a financial resource proposal is one that we kind of develop a list of funding streams and other resources. Commissioner Lashley, you had mentioned, you know, the private school system success in developing kind of that financing 
package. And so this looked very similar to that where we are directing them to uh, different loan programs, grant programs, you know, SBA 504 programs, um, and then offering them that development financing technical assistance through that process. And then other strategic initiatives that we've participated in include um, participating in the, te uh, the Haw River Trail Towns, EDA Award Coalition. You know, that, that was a, something that I got to dabble in in my last job uh, and was subsequently awarded after I left and joined Alamance County. Um, but that's a partnership between TJ Cog, PTRC, Alamance County and Caswell County, or Chatham County, excuse me. Supporting and partnering on EPA fiscal year 23 Brownfield Coalition assessment grant. Supporting local government partners with FEMA, NCDPS, BRIC, FMA applications. That's for, you know, water, sewer, infrastructure primarily, um, big ticket items like flood walls and I&I and &I problems. Um, supporting local partners with other EDA grant applications and administration. Uh, participating in a growth modeling study facilitated by PART. Uh, working with the Burlington Graham MPO on trans, uh, excuse me, transportation infrastructure and economic development opportunities. Supporting the Swepsonville Mill Redevelopment Project with the Development Finance Institute. Hosting the Partners in Progress event on August 30th co-sponsoring the United Way of Alamance County's Housing Summit in collaboration with MDC Rural Forward, and hosting the Economic Summit on uh, October 13th, and finally uh, facilitating community leaders retreat subjects, many of which were centered around economic development. So I, I know that was an exhaustive list, always open to feedback suggestions on how we present this material next time, but in the meantime, do you all have any questions for me or uh, the chamber team? Can you give a little more <coughs> transload facility uh, potential project? What that is and what it, where it is and what it means? Yeah, certainly. So that's a very exciting project. Um, the transload project uh, that we're currently working on uh, takes place in the North Carolina Industrial Center, um, which is uh, an industrial complex uh, that Mebbin participated in many years ago. And it all started, uh, started with Mercedes-Benz, I think is the, the story. Um, so this facility would be a tremendous asset because, you know, industrial uh, employers that don't have maybe a rail spur tying directly to their facility um, are without a doubt absent from that luxury. And rail is an increasingly tremendous asset for industrial suppliers, especially. And so what this asset would do would be to unlock a uh, action point or an access point for all the industries in Alamance County to take advantage of rail. Um, so specifically, it's taking cargo from a train and putting it on a truck? Yes. It's uh, called, well, we would call that as bumping cars, pretty much. Um, so you would do it both ways. You would bump cars from the truck to the train and you will bump cars from the train to the truck. Um, so it's a tremendous asset. It provides that rail access for industrial employers that would otherwise not have it. And right now they're having to travel uh, to Winston-Salem and Fuquay to take advantage of that asset. And you know, think about the market that we could pull for that asset here in Alamance County um, versus sending people to those other areas. And truth be told, those other areas, I haven't seen the numbers, but I would be shocked if they weren't already inundated um, with proposals, and we would likely draw from some of their market as well for such an asset. So it, it would be tremendous indeed. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. Yeah, I just want to ask a question, David, because every time I see you, I mention the word Great Wolf Lodge. It's like <laughs> I stalk you I'm on one of those ears at the next meeting. But anyway, um, this is all wonderful because jobs mean money, mean poor and tax base. I mean, it's just, it's crucial. I mean, yeah. I see counties that are so rural, they have no interstates. It's just really tough for them. And you don't want to just keep beating up your taxpayer. Just, I mean, you really want things. Plus, um, are we going to be a county that 
which all this industry is wonderful. But are we going to be a county that's going to have things that are going to be here that's going to draw other people to come here? Like there is this great whitewater rafting, giant rock wall facility mm -hmm. in Charlotte where the Olympics train. God. And then, I mean, there are just all kind of different things. Zip line, fun sucker, because you won't agree to nothing. But um, I'm just saying, are we ever going to get that kind of mindset to market our county so other counties would want to come here, not just to work and, and be that, which is a big deal, massive big deal, because we've got to have it all. But do we see, I mean, like a civic center, when I ran for office, I've got a video out talking about that. Caswell County has one. I mean, yeah. we could bring all kind of craft shows, all kind of music, all kind of everything here, trade shows. Why are we going to start thinking that way or are we just okay with this? I'm asking that as a, as a citizen because, I mean, you know, I want everybody to have fun here. Matt ballparks to bring in big ball tournaments here. I mean, we used to be the softball capital of the world. I mean, yeah. we've had some really strong names that I would love to see us reinvent, so to speak. Yeah. I, I think you bring up a tremendous point and uh, something... That's money. That's tourism money. Yeah. Oh, did you have some thoughts you wanted to share? So I, I think that's a great question and I think that's something that the community visioning process mm -hmm. will bring to light. Um, it's a process that we want the entire community to participate in. Um, what do we want out of the future of Alamance County? Um, so I think those are those are questions that would be answered during that process. Okay. We already have a lot of great attractions uh, in Alamance County. It makes our job easy sometimes to sell, right? Um, but those those are great answers that we think will come out of that process. I mean, look at the new carousel. I know it was all about how much it cost, but look at it. I mean, that is a rock star for our city as far as our county as well. Who has that? We do. And, you know, that's a, a marketing genius, and you do have to pay for stuff that. Look what they're doing downtown near the Paramount Theater. If they build, I saw, you know, projections of that. We have so many opportunities <clears throat> to be different, not just same old, same old. That's a rut people get into. Leadership can get into that. Churches can get into that. we got to take a step out and really market ourselves well. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking. Well, I know that you will participate 100% in the process. Right? <laughs> you gonna have him, that bow tie and wolf ears. You gonna wear them. And, and so Mr. is Brian Baker. <laughs> Chairman pays it to, Mr. to Commissioner Thompson's comments uh, about the, the oh, Civic Center. We have the TDA. I know has, has funded through a contract uh, a study yes. for a Civic Center. Could you just comment briefly on that? Sure. We're undertaking a feasibility study. We. Uh, contracted with a consultant we expect they'll be on site uh, at the end of the month and putting together a committee to look at various sites and help us figure out how the market could support um, a Civic Center Brian did you have anything else to add you got it and the and the occupancy tax money that comes in from folks who spend the night in hotels correct um, could, is, is a, could is potentially a source fund. of revenue for Mm -hmm. That's correct. That. Yes. And we'll be looking at various um, revenue sources to support such a facility, both construction and operations. And however the Chamber can support that process, yeah. we're here to be a partner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just think sometimes people don't know their potential. We see that in everything. And I think we have amazing potential. We just got to go for it. Mr. Lash. Uh, I have nothing but thank you for your presentation. I wrote down a bunch of companies that you had mentioned, and I can understand you guys being proud of that. I mean, yeah. you, got some good, you got some good, got some really good corporations on that, that list. So all is not lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Thank you for your help. You're a breath of fresh air, David. I yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. Thank you. You and Reagan, you've done a good job. I'm going to wind up with saying, uh, excuse me, a number of things. One, I appreciate what you and you folks are doing currently. Uh, you made a tremendous change in what I see as a county commissioner, and you're coming to us as a county on the front end instead of the back end. And I just want to say thank you. We're good? I want to close by saying we appreciate our partnership with you all, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to item seven, seven. Yes.
commissioners, this is uh, what I'll call phase two or wave two of the opioid settlement. If you recall, um, about a year or so ago, we came to you and said that a $26 billion settlement had been entered into between um, the various plaintiffs in the lawsuit related to opioid abuse and, uh, and the, the situation there had resulted in a $26 billion settlement of which Alamance County was a party. Uh, we received roughly $8.8 .8 million as a part of that wave one settlement. Uh, this is phase two uh, with several other of the defendants related to the opioid litigation, uh, specifically CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, and Allergan are uh, defendants in this part of the settlement. Uh, this is the second time we would ask you to help us enter into an agreement with others. The way these settlements work is that if we get a certain number of plaintiffs on board, defendants are willing to settle claims based on that. Um, last time the state had 100% participation in the settlement agreement that was proposed entered, entered into by Josh Stein. Um, this is our part of that. We need to, by April 18th, <coughs> enter into the settlement for this wave two section. And based on what the application looks like it would be with 100% uh, participation, we would get $7.1 million as a part of our settlement funds with this one. <coughs> Those funds will be available later this year. So what we're asking for as a part of our effort this time is for you to authorize the manager to enter into uh, the settlement agreement that has been proposed by Josh Stein's crew with the state to allow us to participate in that and receive those funds later in 2023. Mr. Turner. Yes. <laughs> Can I go to somebody else? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lashley. Uh, Rick, you said uh, that, that total settlement's 8.8 .8 billion and, okay. and, and North an hour cut is 7.1. I just want to make sure 7.1 numbers. Just right. so I'm clear. So the phase one part of the settlement was $8.87 .8 million to Alamance County. The phase two segment is $7.1 million for a total of roughly $15.98 million for Alamance County, assuming full participation by the other plaintiffs in the allegations. Okay. So if everyone else settles, that's what we're likely to get based on the amount that's been negotiated. And, and Heidi, do we, uh, th is this money is not designated in any particular place? It, it, uh, it's in a special revenue. We've got it reserved in a special <coughs> revenue fund, so it's separated. But it's, it's not, not just uh, going it's in. Not, it, it's not restricted. It is restricted. It is very so restricted. I have to spend it on uh, substance abuse. Uh, it's, it's actually okay. very specific. That's what I thought. It would sort of seem like that would put some stipulations on it since, yes. since we were just yes. talking about the state and how like they're uh, like to have a, a heavy handed approach on almost everything. Well, this is actually part of the negotiation. So the way it was negotiated is that the funds will be spent for certain things only. And so all the accountability measures that were in place for phase one are also been negotiated to be in place for phase two. So there's no change in terms of how we have to spend it. At least it's consistent. That makes it easier for us. But there are distinct stipulations that were part of the negotiation process. Well, yeah. it leads me to that next question. The reason I, I'd say is it, you know, is it restricted? Is so? Is it possible that uh, we could use some of this money for our new diversion center? It is possible. Uh, we'll be bringing this back for further discussion once the rules are stop moving. Um, I need to correct my statement that it's for substance abuse. It's actually for opioid abuse. So it's even more specific than that. Um, but we will be working on some ideas, and of course, the board will come up with a plan for that you can adopt. Thank is there any much. kind of strategic plan coming up with our health department or our county, our leadership, yes. of how to really spend this money instead of just put it in brick and mortar when it comes to the actual addict? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I think at your next meeting, we're planning to have the opioid um, survey that was done yeah. presented. Okay. Mr. Carter. Steve, probably went to lunch. <laughs> okay. No, I'm still here. I have no <laughs> Okay, do you have any uh, comments? No, I think uh, Bill hit some of the points I was thinking. I think this is, I know we can use some of this probably for the Divergent Center. I'm not sure if we can use all of it for that, but uh, I think there's a lot of uses, we need, a lot of needs we have in the county related to the opioid problem, so. Yes. And you're right, it is limited, and if you read through the materials, that points that out. Uh, I'll make a resolution that we authorize the county manager execute all necessary documents to enter into the opioid settlement agreement 
and approval of the supplemental agreement uh, for the additional funds. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. We're getting to the short race. We are. Seven G. Yes. Commissioners, I'm bringing back this proposed vehicle replacement um, policy that we continue to tweak and hone for you. We're trying to put together a policy that will help guide us uh, in the budget so that we have some objective criteria and trying to get a handle on what the vehicle needs are. So um, we have updated this policy with some mileage thresholds, and I'm here to say I have yet another update. Um, so I think when you saw it last time, we were saying that the Sheriff Patrol and Pursuit vehicles, we wanted to consider replacing those at 90,000. The version in front of you says 100,000. <laughs> I have since met with the sheriff uh, Friday afternoon and he's agreed to 125,000. So we're continuing to bump that up a little bit. Um, the other um, maximum mileage threshold. That's for vehicle. That's for his patrol and pursuit. So that would reflect 125,000. Thank you. Um, the other uh, mileage thresholds have not changed um, based on what you had seen last time. I don't believe. Um, <coughs> sorry, Steve. Um, you had also asked about our current fleet. So the average mileage of our current fleet is 89,000 miles. But when I take out the sheriff vehicles from that, since they represent the bulk of our vehicles, the average mileage is 96,000 currently. And then you had also asked me about the number of vehicles meeting the replacement criteria. So unfortunately, I have the old um, criteria uh, when I ran this, but it would have been about 76 sheriff vehicles. I think we can safely say that's probably closer to 50 if we increase that mileage of 125. Uh, we have three ambulances that would meet the criteria for replacement at 250,000 miles. Uh, we have 43 trucks, vans, utility vehicles, and then we have nine cars that would meet the mileage criteria. Um, also, we're using the vehicle age of 10 uh, as the age threshold on that. Um, so we have quite an aged uh, fleet as well. So open to feedback from the board, um, wanting to make sure that this is a policy that we're comfortable with. We know that we cannot afford to do everything at once, but this would give us some guidance uh, that we could phase in over time as we work on a budget. This is just miles, this isn't tires. Uh, no, there's- No, nothing about this, uh, just go to the store. But I'm just curious, there's a whole lot. There's I can't a whole imagine. lot the mileage on tires for law enforcement at the ground they have to cover. Right, yeah. so in order to keep a fleet meeting these mileage, there's quite a bit of maintenance that would be regularly and ongoing. Does our county do all that? Like, do We do not. We have like, to take- Who's our person? It. We don't have a person. We don't have a garage. We allow our departments to go to various- We have a contract with Wilson Tire. Oh, Wilson Tire <laughs> is the contract on the is tires. That every year or is that just- given like that person i don't know um, so if i'm not mistaken and sheriff you can um, speak more there's a contract and it goes out to bid and i believe it's renewed every three years oh, three years okay um, it was brought to the board i believe um at the first part of july that we they now have two locations one here in graham and one out on nc 87 north um that they are a, our county vehicles go there for tire replacement um, they also go there for oil changes and then any extensive work that would need to be done. The exception of that would be if our ambulances need to be serviced by the dealership themselves mm -hmm. um, for more extensive um, replacements and more extensive maintenance and repairs. That big giant green submarine that I went to see down at EMS is it's massive. It's yeah. the new thing. Who, who works on that? So that is, those repairs are handled through rescue themselves. Okay. So they would take care of the maintenance of that vehicle. Okay. Any comments? Quick question. How many ambulances do we have? 
Do you know what our fleet 15, is, Sherry? 12, 15. I think it's 12. I, think it's 12. I can I think it's ask our director, 13. but I am not Well, sure. I mean, just generally, that's a rough number. I mean, it seems that the, the, that the real expense here in this policy is the replacement of ambulances. Ambulances are expensive. They're about an 18-month lead, right. so it's difficult to budget for those in a fiscal year right. if you don't get them. And if we are building a satellite station right. at some point, we would also need ambulances for that. I just wonder if... If you only have 12 to 13 ambulances, if it might make sense that, that you can, I think you can probably just treat those as on an individual basis based on the individual truck. Like, if, if you've got 50 cars, it makes sense to have a policy. If you've got 15, you can, uh, well, this one, you know, the, the steering sticks a little bit. This one, I got a problem with the starter. You, you, can, you can have some sure. specific knowledge about individual trucks and that. It, it might make sense not to have that as part of the policy, but to treat them individually and customize your treatment of those ambulances, especially in light of the cost of them. So, I mean, I think that's a point I'd, I'd want to think about. Potentially removing ambulances, Potentially removing from, ambulances, the ambulances from the policy. But, but, to the board. But looking at them individually and having a plan for them separately. Right. I think this not a road policy, but a an individual customized treatment of individual ambulances as sure. part of your evaluation every year of <laughs> what the needs are. Sure. One thing I would offer here, I have a little bit of experience with this, but there is a way to remove the box from the ambulance and put the box right. on a different chassis and thereby extend the life of the ambulance, at least a lot of the critical right. medical parts yeah. somewhat. So if that's something we've done or would consider do. doing, that would be we do a that, possibility yes. as well. Any other comments? I think the only thing I wanted to say is, uh, is there a mixture of age and mileage? Yes, there is. I mean, is there it's like a, Both. I guess, okay, good. Yes. So I guess if you got the one, you would probably check out the second. So we're looking at the age, the mileage, and then whether there are any other um, repair needs or condition of the vehicle. There are also sometimes repairs needed that are so expensive it would... Yeah behoove us to just replace. So we look at all three of those in making a determination. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You really don't need a vote on this, is my understanding. Uh, only if the board wants to adopt the policy. If they don't, then it would be an internal policy that we could use as well. So all either right, way we, works for us. Do we have a motion? Just getting some feedback. Mm -hmm. If you really think you need one. Is that I what know, Craig was talking right. about? No. Yeah. To individual as need for ambulances is that going to be the policy or we just that is up to the board okay. Okay. happy to do it either way well no I mean I think that makes sense uh, I yeah. got three kids but they all don't get maintenance at the same time <laughs> 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 I mean one breaks and the other two are just fine I mean it's like what are you talking about boy I, mother of the year right here <laughs> but you understand that I do okay thank you I'm trying to help you well, I, I would I would uh I'll make a motion that we accept the policy as amended this morning with the exception of the ambulances. The 125 number is what you're using. 250,000 is the oh, sheriff's cards. 125 is yeah. Oh, correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? No. Thank you. Thank you. County Manager. Um, I'm got one little informational item I wanted to let the board um, know. We had heard from a citizen about uh, the difficulty sometimes being able to access the meetings and make public comment, and the clerk has let me know that with our new software, we would be able to um, accept electronic public comment. So we're going to be working on how we market that, what that would look like, but it would allow for folks to submit comments and then you could see them electronically um, if they're not able to attend the meeting. So work in progress, but thought that was uh, might be helpful to our residents who are not able to contribute. Would that be done during meetings, or would it be done outside of the meetings? It would be before the meetings. It'd have to be before the start of the meeting, so they could submit them ahead of the meeting, and it could be shared. But the actual presentation would be during the meeting. Yeah, like, so what it would look like, like when you go on to the portal to view the agenda, they would have the option to go ahead and put 
their comments out there so you would actually see what they had already posted. Kind of like Times News comments or like Facebook yes. comments. Yes. yes. Okay. So we may be working on that to allow for more involvement in your meetings. I just wanted to make you aware. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. County Commissioners. Ms. Thompson? No. Ms. Lashley? Mr. Turner? One quick comment, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to, to hit again the um, the consideration of reallocation of, of revenue streams currently going to ABSS. I understand the concern in the community. Yeah. I have kids in public schools. I want safe, clean, uh, attractive public schools. Um, but this board has some work to do to determine the scope of what a courthouse might look like, which necessitates revenue to create whatever that vision is. And we haven't done, we haven't got a, a consensus on that, what that is yet. So I would just encourage everyone that, to understand that we understand the concern, that I understand the concern, but to wait until we get specific numbers, both in terms of what's projected to go into the capital plan as, as it exists now, and what the actual options may be in terms of um, funding. Because before we, ha we have lots of different options, we have lots of different funding models. Let's wait till we have a specific proposal and see what that number is with no change and what that number is with some change potentially. And then let's have that, let's have that conversation. I, I do have a question, not question, but just comment. Um, uh, thank you. I was looking at, um, there was a post on Facebook from like Swepsonville and their ballpark. It's, um, I've played many a ball tournament. It's back in there close to the river that comes in there. And they're needing a great lot of work because it's all wood and wood wears out sooner or later. And, um, and I was just curious because I'm very in support of our county helping some of our rural ball fields really build themselves back up so that community will be strong with activities for young people. And I'm sure this is going to be a chunk of change. And Swepsonville is not New York City. No, we don't have a New York City in this county. Is that ever a project? Because I'm really, as my pastor says, meddling. But is that ever some kind of project that we can collaborate with them? Because talk about mental health and art money and all this other stuff. Is that ever <coughs> something that we could have talks with them to help them with something like that? Because, you know, it's just not all concrete it's wood it's out in the woods it's ball fields it's everything to really get good healthy environments for our entire county so kids will have somewhere to go and their parents can sit in the stands and watch them instead of they're on the streets I mean it's just that's just what it is nowadays and I didn't know if this is I mean I, I'm sure this is really meddling but I didn't know if this is something that our county would ever have a conversation about to see if there's some way we could help them to achieve that because that's a real anchor in that community I mean I'm just asking this question that's all I just need to be a fairy godmother and have a wand that's what we need yeah. so just ask him comments no sir I've spoken up today all right mr. Carter uh, none at this time thank you and I'm waving as well county attorney nothing for me in open session today but we do have a couple of closed sessions for you to consider today the first would be under 143 year 318.11 a4 related to the expansion of industries and the discussion of economic development incentives there uh, related to that and the second would be uh, under section 83 related to consulting with an attorney to discuss uh, attorney client privilege matters about Allison v. All, v I'm sorry Allison at all, be Allen at all, and other legal matters with which the county is related. We'll move that that we go, okay. go into closed session. Second. Motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're now in closed session. Okay, we are out of the closed session. We uh, took a vote to get out just a minute ago. Uh, is there anything else for this board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.
Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.